Section Zero of An American Vendetta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. An American Vendetta A Story of Barbarism in the United States by T. C. Crawford. Section Zero Preface soon after my return to this country last august from england i fell into conversation with an english friend who complained of the lack of dramatic features in what he called the prosaic life of america i had then just heard of the hatfield and mccoy vendetta of west virginia and kentucky and called the english critic's attention to this most remarkable feud he thought the stories concerning it exaggerated the result of this conversation was a desire to make a personal investigation of this country where the feud was said to exist i found colonel cockerell of the world agreeably inclined and indeed a warm supporter of my plan to visit this country upon the day of my return ill and almost broken down having lost fifteen pounds of flesh within a week and not able to stand up from pain a friend and southern man at that said don't wait until you are rested before writing your story tell your story while you are hot and down i followed his advice literally the first chapters and the essential parts of the story were dictated within three hours after my return to new york i have not attempted to change the story as then told while still worn and exhausted by my long journey of ten days without proper food or sleep it was owing to suggestions from colonel cockrell and mr wilson editor of the weekly world that these articles have taken the form of a book the illustrations from the pen of mr graves have caught in the most striking manner the spirit and character of the people and country i have sought to describe they alone give a value to the book whatever may be said about the rest t c c new york november twenty sixth eighteen eighty eight end of section zero recording by john brandon section one of an american vendetta this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. An American Vendetta. A Story of Barbarism in the United States. By T. C. Crawford. Chapter 1. I have been away in Murderland for nearly ten days no one unless he has had the actual experience of a visit to the region made notorious by the hatfield mccoy feud would believe that there is in this country such a barbarous uncivilized and wholly savage region there is nothing to be found equaling it in the history of the most lawless of our far western border experience the county of logan in west virginia where the powerful mountain family of hatfield now lives embraces a region wholly isolated from railroad or telegraphic communication there is not in the county of logan a single church built by popular effort in fact there is only one church throughout this great county this is upon the big sandy it was built by private enterprise the man who contributed died before it was finished and the building in its incomplete state is now used by ignorant itinerant preachers indeed there are three other counties in the vicinity of logan which are identical in point of condition there are no churches and the schoolhouses supply very meager means of educating the children of the mountain people who live in this isolated region i visited this country for the purpose of getting at if possible the exact facts connected with the hatfield mccoy feud a feud is one of the most dramatic and striking features of life 
the corsican vendetta has been the subject of many a play and story but the vendetta of these west virginia wilds is so far beyond anything ever known in the annals of corsica that it merits very elaborate and careful consideration i found after visiting this region that there was much more to be considered here than the feud itself the vendetta so called which exists between the hatfield mccoy families is merely an incident in a series of cold-blooded murders which are almost without parallel in the history of the country the story of the feud is a strange recital of family quarrels of the usurpation of legal authority and of the downright violation of the law in every possible form End of chapter 1 Recording by John Brandon Section 2 of An American Vendetta This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon An American Vendetta a story of barbarism in the united states by t c crawford chapter two getting at the facts every stranger is suspected and regarded as a detective in disguise to get at the story of the feud i found was very difficult the mountaineers talk in the most rambling way they are the most suspicious people upon the face of the earth every one who visits that region who is not a land speculator or a drummer is regarded as a detective i had been fully advised of this in advance and was fortunate enough to secure for my companion john b floyd the assistant secretary of state who knows these people thoroughly they all have confidence in him and it was through his influence that i was enabled to get at these people and to see the Hatfields, men who have never been reached by a newspaper correspondent, where murder is considered creditable. During the course of my investigation, I was enabled to visit the home of Ants Hatfield, commonly known as Devil Ants, to pass the lines of his centuries and hold an interview with this redoubtable outlaw, who now with a large reward upon his head, has built himself a fort in the mountains where he intends to sell out his life at the dearest possible price rather than surrender to officers of the law in order to fully understand the atmosphere in which such a vendetta could possibly be carried on it is necessary to look outside of the families of the hatfields and the mccoys coming gradually to this place i had opportunities of talking with numerous citizens of the state and from them i learned through many conversations that it was rare that murder was ever punished in the state and that quarrels were much more commonly settled with the knife or the pistol than in any other way during the day which i was obliged to wait at charlestown i had several distinguished persons pointed out to me as men who had killed their man and who had not been punished one genteel slim-looking young fellow with a daredevil face and the set-up of an army officer was pointed out as an especially vindictive and quick killer he had not very long ago tried to kill an inoffensive barkeeper for the very serious reason that he had not put ginger ale in his whiskey as he had ordered as the unfortunate barkeeper recovered from this murderous assault it was not thought worth while by the prosecuting attorney to push the case only a few weeks ago one of the colored employees at the hotel ruffner came back to the hotel at three o'clock in the morning he persisted in coming into the hotel although it was against the rule to admit employees to the building after a certain hour the night clerk told him to go away from the front door the colored man refused to go 
the night clerk then told him to go or he would be sorry for it the obdurate colored man still persisted and then the clerk drew his pistol and promptly killed this black fellow for his impudence when the night clerk was tried it was shown that this vindictive black wretch had actually made a movement of his hand towards his hip pocket during the controversy and as a necessary consequence the night clerk was acquitted on the ground of self-defense i asked the gentleman who gave me this information concerning the shooting what would have been the effect if there had been a colored night clerk and the man who had sought to enter the hotel had been a white man he said that undoubtedly the verdict of the jury would have been different there was great excitement among the negroes after this and they gathered together one night resolved to lynch the night clerk but the whites also rallied and one of them remarked to me during my visit we are awfully sorry that those colored people changed their minds about coming down because we would have reduced the republican majority in this district by a right smart number if they had only consented to come i merely give these illustrations to indicate the light way in which the taking of life is regarded among the people of this section even outside of the wild and barbarous region dominated by the hatfield mccoy feud while there may be no more murders committed in proportion to the population than in more civilized states it is a fact that the murders committed are by men in a different rank in life and that the pretexts are more often trivial in consequential quarrels than elsewhere the hatfield and mccoy families are the two leading mountain families of their region the hatfields live on the east side of the tug river in west virginia the mccoys live in pike county kentucky on the other side of the river these two families own large tracts of land and are thoroughly well to do neither of the heads of the families reads nor writes some of the children now growing up have the rudiments of an ordinary education the two families have had very close relations at different times by marriage and through business relations during the war they were organized on both sides of the river what were known as home guards these home guards were organized ostensibly for the protection of the property interests of this region against an invading foe but instead of becoming a real home defense they invariably followed the practice of robbery and murder and practically led an outlaw life the hatfields on one side and the mccoys on the other ranged and plundered and as a necessary consequence their interests often clashed so the first quarrel began as far back as in 1863 when harmon mccoy was killed by Anse hatfield that is to say common report credits him with the killing the difficulty of obtaining evidence as to any particular crime is something beyond the power of any ordinary court or commission the mountaineers are reticent and even the best people of the community who do not sympathize in any way with crime and who would be delighted if they could be freed from the presence of these outlaws will not furnish a scrap of information or give even an opinion which could possibly involve them in some trouble with these domineering outlaws who have so long ruled arbitrarily this region end of section two recording by john brandon section three of an american vendetta this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. An American Vendetta, A Story of Barbarism in the United States by T. C. Crawford. Chapter 3A, Part 1. Chapter 3. How the Feud Began. The Story of the Brutal Warfare and the Leading Spirits in It. 
I propose now to give in brief, and in their consecutive order, the crimes which properly can be credited to the feud. Aside from the killing of Harmon McCoy in 1863, the motive of the breaking out of the feud in 1882 can be directly traced to a love affair between Johnson Hatfield and Rosanna McCoy. Rosanna McCoy was the daughter of Randall McCoy, the chief of the McCoy family in Pike County. Johns Hatfield, in the language of the Mountaineers, took up with her, captured her, and brought her over to the West Virginia side. It was during this period that Bill Stanton, a brother-in-law of Ellison and Anse Hatfield, was killed. He was a quarrelsome young fellow, according to the reports, and had had repeated quarrels with Sam McCoy. The latter was one of the most active of the McCoys. His character corresponded very much to that of Captain Hatfield, on the opposite side. Both were killers. Both were very fond of hunting, the noble sport of man. Sam McCoy once chased Staten up to Ellison Hatfield, Young Staten, from behind the back of Ellison Hatfield, snapped a pistol at McCoy. Ellison Hatfield stopped that quarrel, but later Sam McCoy met Staten. Sam was accompanied by his brother, Paris. The two young men began shooting at each other on sight. Staten was hit. They advanced towards each other rapidly, and in the final clinch, young Staten bit or set his teeth in the cheek of Sam McCoy. Paris McCoy then came up with his revolver and blew out the brains of Staten. Now, it must be borne in mind that these two young men were tried by a Hatfield magistrate and acquitted. Paris, who had no part in the fight beyond coming up and killing Staten as he was struggling with his brother, was promptly arrested and as promptly acquitted. Sam, who escaped, was not captured until about a year afterwards, when he was tried before Wall Hatfield and also acquitted. This was previous to 1882. Taking the law into their own hands. Now comes the second step in the procession of incidents. The McCoys were very much irritated against Johns Hatfield for his leading away Rosanna McCoy. She had returned to the Kentucky side. Although she had lived with Johns Hatfield, they were not married. And when she returned to the Kentucky side, he still continued to visit her. So the McCoys resolved to get even with Johns the next time he crossed the river. And in order to do so, they made up their minds to use the weapons of the law. They procured from the local justice of the peace, after some difficulty, a warrant for Johns's arrest for carrying concealed weapons. The burlesque of this is in the fact that this warrant was handed over to two men who were themselves loaded down with revolvers and knives. At one o'clock that night, Johns Hatfield was captured, and a party of nine men started with him for the Pike County Jail. Rosanna McCoy was with him at the time of the arrest, which was at one o'clock in the morning. Half-dressed, she rushed to the nearest horse on her father's place, mounted it, and started out at a breakneck pace on one of the roughest roads in the world. Over rocks, down deep declivities, through the beds of running streams, she rode like the wind until she reached the house of Anse Hatfield. She notified him what had been done. Anse Hatfield immediately turned out his crowd. They crossed the river. Three of them came up in time to head off the party of nine who were carrying Johns Hatfield to the jail. They stood them up under the cover of darkness with their Winchesters and demanded the release of the suffering innocent who had been arrested for the carrying of concealed weapons. Anse Hatfield told me afterwards that he gave the crowd a good tongue-lashing for what they had been trying to do with his boy, but I have been told that he then and there voted in favor of killing every one of them, so great was his rage, and was only persuaded to stay his hand by the calm, good advice of Elias Hatfield, who is today one of the best men to be found on either side of the river in this most melancholy region. The Murder of Ellison Hatfield this quarrel over the girl and the bad blood engendered by this tremendous night ride and raid led directly to the killing of Ellison Hatfield. This is the first pronounced and striking crime which led to the many which have followed in the history of this feud of blood. Ellison Hatfield was noted throughout the country as being a peacemaker. He was a strong, square, resolute man, always anxious to avoid a quarrel when he could do so without appearing to endanger his reputation for courage. But all of the Hatfields were inclined to be domineering, and they are so closely allied by marriage with the McCoys and with other families in Kentucky that they have from time to time taken as much interest in the local elections on the west side of the Tug River as they have on the east. In 1882, Ellison Hatfield, with a number of the members of his family, went over on election day into Pike County, and while there became engaged in a controversy with the McCoys. There had been another subject for dispute between the Hatfields and McCoys besides the question of Rosanna. There had been a dispute about some hogs. Floyd Hatfield had lost some hogs that had strayed among the McCoy pigs, and he had to appeal to a magistrate to recover his property. 
This most petty of subjects led to a very serious dispute. This dispute was brought to focus by one of the Hatfields becoming engaged in a quarrel with one of the McCoys over the matter of a dollar and seventy-five cents, when they began to draw their weapons and show signs of fight. Ellis and Hatfield then interfered, and as he did so, four of the McCoys closed upon him and killed him. Three of the McCoys stabbed him with their knives. He was cut in at least twenty-four different places. One of the younger McCoys, who had been represented as being too much of a child to be involved in this murder, was yet the age of sixteen. This is quite old enough for any such affair as this. There are numerous witnesses, moreover, who saw this youngest fellow doing most of the cutting in the back of Ellison Hatfield. Floyd McCoy, who escaped and who never was tried for participation in this murder, is said to have run up and fired a pistol directly against the body of Ellison Hatfield. Elias Hatfield was present, and he came to the rescue of his kinsman, only too late. He chased and ran down one of the leading McCoys, shooting his revolver at him five times in the chase. I had the story of this from Elias Hatfield's own lips. The great Hatfield family, made up of mountaineers, hunters, and strong, daring men, were never so badly hurt in their pride as when Ellison Hatfield fell. They arrested the three McCoys and carried them across the river to the West Virginia side to await the result of the injuries to Ellison Hatfield. Ellison Hatfield was attacked on Monday, and on the following Wednesday, he died. After his death, a mysterious party took the three McCoys over to the Kentucky side and blew out their brains, leaving them on the ground where they were shot. The Kentucky authorities have indicted the guards who were placed over them for this offense, but Elias Hatfield, who was one of the guards, says that a strong party came up and took possession of the prisoners and went off with them in the darkness and that the guards were in no way responsible. Common report places the execution, or the murder, just as you please, of these three men upon Ants Hatfield, who is today the leader of the Hatfield side. Although Ants Hatfield can probably show that he was not actually present at the killing, yet the credit of it undoubtedly belongs to him. This will be more clearly shown when the interview which I had with this chief of outlaws comes to be read, where he explained to me his theory concerning the killing and under what circumstances he considered it justified. A truce for a while. This very decided act of retaliation upon the part of the Hatfields for a time subdued the McCoys. For five years there was nothing more than the ordinary neighborhood quarreling. Murders which were committed during those years in brawls, barroom rows, election fights, and disputes which grew out of trials at court were incidental killings which had no relation to the great feud. In 1887, the local authorities of Pike County began to agitate the subject of punishing the murderers, and rewards were proclaimed by the governor through the influence of Perry Klein, a brother-in-law of Randolph McCoy. It is charged against Klein that he got up this whole business to make money, and that he thought, if he could get the governor to issue a proclamation of a large reward, that he would be able to make terms with the Hatfields and get them to pay him a good sum of money for getting the rewards withdrawn. Klein appears in various roles throughout this controversy. In one place he writes to Anse Hatfield for $500, and obtains it upon the theory that he is to get the governor to set the rewards aside. Klein overstepped himself in this, and was unable to procure the revocation of the proclamation and so he returned the money to Ants Hatfield. Last year he was the unswerving prosecutor of the Hatfields and everybody in connection with them. Now he is the special attorney of the Kentuckians in Pike County Jail who were on the Hatfield side. Undoubtedly, the stimulus of the rewards stirred up local feeling. It was such an unusual thing to punish for murder that nothing could have been done in this direction if the rewards had not been offered. But the administration of the law had been so long abused that it was not possible to put it in good working order through the simple means of offering a reward. End of chapter 3a, part 1. Section 4 of An American Vendetta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An American Vendetta, A Story of Barbarism in the United States, by T. C. Crawford. Chapter 3A, Part 2. How Jeff McCoy Paid the Penalty. The next murder which occurred between the Hatfields and the McCoys, and 
directly growing out of this renewed agitation brought about by the offering of the rewards was that of Jeff McCoy. Jeff McCoy had killed a man by the name of Woodford in Kentucky, and during the mild indignation upon the subject, had crossed over to the West Virginia side to wait for subsidence of the local prejudice. While over there, he visited Captain Hatfield, who had a man by the name of Wallace working for him. Jeff McCoy got into a quarrel with Wallace and shot him in the hip that evening during the course of a heated argument. It was a mere flesh wound, and no mountaineer lays up with anything short of actual bone break. Wallace and Captain Hatfield spent the greater part of the night in discussing what they should do with Jeff McCoy, whether they should take him to Logan Courthouse and have him tried for the shooting of Wallace, or whether they should force him back to Kentucky to be tried for the actual killing of Woodford. They finally concluded to take him to Logan Courthouse, and so again, using the language of this country, they arrested him and started for Logan Courthouse. On their way there, Jeff cut the rope that bound him, got away, ran to the river, and started to swim across. Wallace shot at him a number of times, and Captain Hatfield probably as well. He was killed just as he reached the opposite bank, and so that case was settled. McCoy's Raiding Hatfield Territory There now began a series of raids between the states of Kentucky and West Virginia, which have been misrepresented and misunderstood simply on account of the meager reports which come out from time to time from this most distant region. The governor of Kentucky directed certain deputies, and principally one by the name of Phillips, living in Pike County, to receive certain prisoners from West Virginia, upon the governor of which state requisitions were to be made. Phillips misconstrued this authority according to the domineering idea of the mountaineer, and honestly started out with the view that he was to cross the river and himself execute the arrest upon the soil of the state of West Virginia. So he astonished and outraged the citizens of that state by swooping down one day with a guard of thirty or forty people and capturing a man by the name of Tom Chambers, whom he carried off to the Pike County Jail. Chambers was charged with being an accessory to the murder of the three McCoys who were executed for the murder of Ellison Hatfield. This raid caused great indignation and was given out to the country as the raid of the McCoy family in the interest of the feud. There followed very soon afterwards a second raid led by Phillips. In this second raid, Kurt McCoy and Moses Christian were captured, and it led to one of the most terrible crimes in the history of the feud, murdering an innocent girl. The Hatfields are able, daring, vindictive men, and as they could not understand these raids, they thought that they were inspired by the McCoys. They did not understand their assumption of legal character, and so the house of Randolph McCoy one night was surrounded by the Hatfield crowd. The house was fired into, a sharp volley was returned, and then, seeing that they were likely to receive as good as they could give, the house was set on fire and the family driven out. In the escape of the family from the house, a daughter, a poor girl in the neighborhood of sixteen years of age, something of an invalid, was shot deliberately by one of the attacking party. The old lady was beaten about the head with a gun so that her life was despaired of for several days, and one of the sons was killed. The house was burned to the ground. Randolph McCoy, the head of the family, escaped. This burning of the house and the atrocious murders in connection with it brought on another raiding party under the head of Phillips. Phillips, who is a young, smooth-faced, dark-complexioned fellow of about twenty-seven, fond of adventure and power, was fired with the spirit of the feud. He came over not as an officer of the law, because if he had understood his duties, he would have known that 
his invasion of the state of West Virginia without proper authority only placed his acts upon a par with the outlawry which he was ostensibly seeking to put down. In this third raid made by Phillips, James Vance, who was the leader at the house burning, was captured and killed. Vance was a powerful man, beyond the medium point of life. He was a vindictive fighter, and it is related by one of Philip's men that when they came up to the old fellow as he was dying, they found him with his right forefinger clasped around the trigger of his pistol, trying with his last dying strength to shoot one more shot. Phillips and his crowd, after they killed Vance, robbed him of a number of his personal effects, which they carried back with them to Kentucky. This I have learned from several Pike County people and from one of the magistrates of that neighborhood. The people who are supposed to be responsible for this house burning and the crimes connected therewith are Johns Hatfield, Cap Hatfield, James Vance, Tom Mitchell, French Ellis, Bob Hatfield, Elliot Hatfield, Charles Gillespie, and Ellis Mounts. Since my return to Charleston, the chief of detectives of the state of West Virginia informed me that Gillespie has been arrested and will be turned over to the Kentucky authorities at Catlettsburg by the first of next week. Gillespie has made a full confession, and it is said his confession will be sufficient to implicate all of the people above named. He says that Mounts killed the girl and beat the old lady about the head, and that Cap Hatfield killed the son at the time of the house burning raid. End of section four. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section five of An American Vendetta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vicki VM. An American Vendetta, a story of barbarism in the United States by T.C. Crawford. Chapter 3A, Part 3. Shooting from Ambush. Before Phillips made his fourth raid, J.M. Jackson, magistrate of Logan Courthouse, issued a warrant for Phillips' arrest for the murder of Vance. Warrants were placed in the hands of J.R. Thompson, constable of Logan County. He summoned a posse of seven or eight men, among whom was William Dempsey. He intended to execute the warrants only if he found the parties in West Virginia. He proceeded in the direction of the scene of trouble, and while passing down the Grapevine Creek, a tributary of Sandy River, and in crossing an open field, he and his posse were charged upon by Phillips, who lay in ambush under the river bank on the West Virginia side. After a sharp fight with Winchester rifles, in which some hundreds of shots were exchanged, the West Virginia posses of constables, being overpowered, retired, leaving Dempsey on the ground, he having been wounded in the leg during the fight. Dempsey was an enemy, and in his coming out that morning was acting strictly in accordance with law. He had been legally summoned and was acting under a constable who was upon the soil of his own state. As the Phillips party came up, young Dempsey called out for a drink of water and began to beg for his life, as he saw after his first remark that the alleged representative of the governor of the state of Kentucky was more to be dreaded than the wild outlaws of the mountains. Phillips came directly towards him, and in answer to the plea of the wounded young man lying upon the ground, he picked up his Winchester and deliberately walked up, placed it against his forehead, blew out his brains, and then moved off with his party back towards Kentucky. I have had the evidence of this from both sides. There is one of Phillips' party now under indictment in Logan Courthouse. His name is Bill Staten. 
He was under trial while I was there for complicity in Phillips' illegal acts, to put it mildly, and Staten said that he withdrew from Phillips after the murder of Dempsey. Large Rewards In this fourth raid of Phillips, when Dempsey was killed, he captured Wall Hatfield, Mayhow, Dal McCoy, and Andrew Varney. Since that time, there has fully as large a reward been placed upon Phillips' head by the West Virginia authorities as has been placed by the Kentucky authorities upon the leader of the Hatfields. There has been a great deal of friction between the two governors. There has been so much irritation upon the part of West Virginia people on account of the invasion of the state that it has much complicated matters. Upon the West Virginia side, it is said that the governor has never yet refused requisitions when proper conditions were promised. For instance, the governor holds that he could not turn over any of the Hatfields or any of the people desired by the Kentucky authorities to such a man as Phillips or to any of the Pike County authorities. On account of the tremendous local prejudice and the utter lack of any enforcement of law in the neighborhood where the presence of these West Virginia outlaws is desired to be obtained. On the watch for detectives. Phillips is at present encamped with 30 or 40 of his followers in the neighborhood of Peters Creek. They are living in much the same position of suspicion and trepidation as the Hatfields, and he knows that large rewards are out for himself and his associates, and they are ready to kill on sight any detectives who are going about this country trying to earn some of the sums offered by the two governors. The last report from Catlettsburg was that the breaking out of the feud owed its foundation to the fact that Kentucky Bill or Wild Bill, as he calls himself, a western frontiersman who has come into this neighborhood to act as a detective for the West Virginia side. He has sworn that he will capture Phillips. He crossed over to the Kentucky side and during his visits there has captured from two to three people who have not been charged with being associates of Phillips. Upon two separate occasions, Wild Bill has been shot at by the Peters Creek crowd and upon the first occasion, some 150 shots were fired at him. It is one of the remarkable things in connection with the history of these people, who shoot so much and who shoot so well at marks in ordinary practice that when they come to shoot at people, they shoot so wide of the mark. Hiding two days in a log. Wild Bill, a few weeks ago, was chased by the Peters Creek crowd and pushed so closely that he had to use a bit of dime novel strategy to get away from them. Seeing a hollow log on the way, he threw off his cap and coat, and running down some distance beyond the log, he dropped the coat, and then running a further distance, he dropped the hat. Then he came back to the log and crawled into it. His pursuers soon came up and sat upon the log and discussed what they would do with him if they should find him. He had to remain in that log two days before he could succeed in making his escape. He was shot at last in the heel. This is the story of the last outbreak. It cannot be called an outbreak. It was merely an attack on detectives, and this is really what all the shooting along the border now amounts to. It is not safe for any stranger to go into this neighborhood unless he is accompanied by someone locally known. Every stranger is sure to be regarded as a detective, and of course with unpleasant results. Both sides at present are very weary of the quarrel, and if it were possible for it to be settled, I am sure that the McCoys and the Hatfields would agree upon a truce. But there would be no guarantee of its continuing. The impossibility of attempting to settle any of the disputes on a law and order basis was well illustrated in an incident in the feud which, not rising to the dignity of a crime, was not included in the earlier part of this narrative. A Sample of Local Justice Bob Hatfield encountered Bud McCoy near the border. McCoy was in ambush and shot at Hatfield. The ball entered his coat passed along the line of his breast, but it did not touch him, or rather scamp him, as they say. He turned and faced his enemy and brought him out. 
Bob Hatfield is one of the peaceable boys, so he said to this Bud McCoy, who is the bully of the McCoy faction, What did you go to kill me for? What have I done to you? And he then and there remarked that he would take the law upon him. This, it must be remembered, was in the early history of the feud. He proceeded to the prosecuting attorney of Pike County and laid his case before him and was gravely informed by that high dignitary that no man could make him darken the doors of Pike County Jail with any man or any set of men for the mere killing of one or all of the Hatfield gang. It is not to be wondered when the Hatfields, and possibly the McCoys, in their time have met with such replies from local magistrates that they have felt like taking the law in their own hands and executing the ancient policy of retaliation. End of Section 5 Recording by Vicki VM Section 6 of An American Vendetta this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An American Vendetta, a story of barbarism in the United States, by T. C. Crawford. Chapter 3. B. Entanglements of the Feud. Rosanna's Love Romance. How Murder Has Broken and Crippled the McCoys. The great romance of the feud is in the history of Rosanna McCoy and Johns Hatfield. Johns Hatfield was a married man when he fell in love with Rosanna McCoy. But the mountaineers have no rule of morality. It is not an unusual thing to find in this mountain district men with two or three wives, and it has even been called to my attention where one woman has lived with two or three husbands. Johns Hatfield is a handsome fellow tall broad-shouldered with a dark complexion set off by a black moustache and a slight beard his features are irregular he has a daredevil look he is one of the most courageous of the hatfield crowd he is not inclined to be quarrelsome but he is the last one to leave a fight he first met rosanna mccoy at an election gathering in pike county rosanna was then a fresh-faced regular-featured girl of eighteen this was in 1882, before the killing of Ellison Hatfield. She came down to the election meeting, riding pillion fashion behind one of her brothers. The women in these communities, where they are not outcasts, have very little to say. They are mere passive spectators at most of the gatherings in the mountains, and in the household circle they have very little to do beyond attending to their domestic affairs. They occupy much the same position as the squaws in the Indian tribes of the West. Rosanna McCoy pleased John Hatfield very much. He became engaged in conversation with her, and found that she was very much interested in him, because he was one of the most active of the Hatfields, and for some weeks a quarrel had been brewing between the two families. He met her before any of the killing, however, had begun becoming inflamed with liquor drank at this election gathering he was perfectly infatuated with rosanna mccoy and proposed to her to elope with him and go back to the kentucky side she objected but he was so furious and vindictive that she did not dare to resist him securing his wife by force towards the close of the night he was seen by the mccoys crossing the river with rosanna seated comfortably behind him on his strong black horse john hatfield took her to his home and told his wife that he had brought home rosanna mccoy and forced her to acknowledge her as the head of the house he lived with rosanna for over a year the mccoys making frequent attempts to cross the river and rescue the girl she undoubtedly must have been satisfied with her bondage because when it was broken off it was renewed through her consent towards the end of the year the mccoys made such a demonstration that rosanna concluded to return particularly as her father threatened that if she did not she would have none of his property when it came to a division after his death but although she returned to the kentucky side john's hatfield constantly visited her and it was upon one of the occasions of his visiting her that he himself was captured by the mccoy crowd he was taken at one o'clock in the morning 
rosanna mccoy believed that he was being carried out to his death and the mccoys as much as said that they were going to kill him she crawled out of her bed after this arrest unfastened a horse from her father's stables and started off in the blackest of black night to warn the hatfields the roads between the mccoy household and the hatfield place are simply a succession of gulches rocks bogs creeks and madly flowing rivers how the girl was able to pick her way over these tremendous obstacles can probably be explained only by the intelligence of the horse who being familiar with the region was able to pick a footing over what is difficult enough to pass over in the daytime surely that night ride and her alarm of this household would make a subject for a dramatic poem the girl was the heroine of an illicit love yet she was as faithful and devoted to her lover as if he were the most worthy she risked her life over and over again that night to bring the rescue party to him midnight raid on the mccoys the rising of the hatfields who followed the girl back was the work of but a few moments and the subsequent capture of their kidnapped son was a sharp piece of dramatic action it is one of the mysteries to-day of the whole feud that the shooting did not begin then and there as aunt's hatfield was exasperated into a white heat of fury over the capture of his son and the possibilities involved in the midnight arrest that love affair has been the basis of the feud the wrong done to rosanna mccoy was bitterly felt by the mccoy family and it explains much of their irrational hatred of the hatfields the hatfields thus far are the decided winners they have not lost a single one of their number the mccoy family is broken and rendered nearly powerless randall mccoy whom i saw the other day is a broken-down old man he is tall broad-shouldered with deep sunken gray eyes and a rugged gray mustache and beard he has outlived all animosities and all desire for revenge he has lost five of his children under the most cruel and revolting circumstances and he hopes for nothing in this world he has been repeatedly shot at himself he says that the last time he was standing at the open doorway in his house a bullet whizzed past him and entered the door jamb he is much poorer than the hatfields his house is a humble log cabin with only one or two windows in the back part of his house there are no doors its furnishings are of the plainest and the poorest of the mountain class his sons are moderately well-to-do james mccoy is the elder of the family he is a hard-working man careful and anxious if possible to avoid any continuance of the feud but bud mccoy is a character who corresponds to cap hatfield of the other side he is cruel vindictive and quarrelsome and has made frequent attempts to shoot the hatfields from ambush he is a man who will not become reconciled to any settlement and swears that he will take every opportunity he can to kill the hatfields will the warfare ever end in discussing any question about the settlement of this feud it is well to look at the practical side of the question how can the feud be settled there are no law officers on either side of the river who make a pretense of enforcing the law it would not be possible to procure witnesses of any of the murder cases with the exception of the house burning and with the best of witnesses no jury in pike county or logan county would convict a man of murder of which there was the slightest evidence of the killing occurring in anything like what might be termed a fair fight the mccoys have been completely broken down since their house was burned on new year's night in eighteen eighty seven the murders committed then and the furious onslaught upon their property have cowed and subdued them it was the first time in the history of the feud that the killing was extended to women it is possibly this feature of it which has stirred up the kentucky authorities they have as i mentioned in my article last week one witness as to who participated in the horrible crimes of that night but whether he can be held and the people indicated by him arrested is a question it would take at least half a regiment of soldiers to capture the hatfields there are none of the local authorities brave enough to try it end of section six
Section 7 of An American Vendetta This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An American Vendetta, A Story of Barbarism in the United States by T.C. Crawford Chapter 4, Part 1 The Outlaws at Home, A Talk with the Murderous Hatfields and Their Version of the Feud on Sunday I had a long talk with Elias Hatfield at Logan Courthouse. Elias Hatfield is one of the best of the whole family. He is tall, deep-chested, and round-shouldered with a powerful frame. He has a face very decidedly English in its lines. He has a broad forehead, deep-set, clear blue eyes, a big Roman nose, hooked, and a very determined chin. His cheekbones are high, and his face rather sharp in its features. Rugged brown, stubby mustache and side whiskers partially covered his face. He wore a suit of brown butternut. His shirt was a blue jeans, without any collar. His hat was heavy straw, and his trousers were tucked into high boots. I noticed under his waistband a leather girdle holding a holster for a six-shooter. He was very nervous during his conversation with me. He kept looking out of the window, and at every unusual sound would turn as quick as a flash. He evidently felt very ill at ease, and it was only after several days of acquaintance with him that he talked freely. He had left his home on Tug River to get away from the quarrels. He had come to Logan Courthouse to see if he could keep out of these quarrels in the future, he said he was present at the killing of Ellison Hatfield. He did his best to kill one of the McCoys, but that was the only time he has taken up weapons to participate in the bloody incidents of the feud. For a man of his class, he is very well-to-do. He owns a farm of several hundred acres and is devoted to his children, yet it was clear to be seen that he had peculiar ideas on the subject of killing. Everybody spoke of him in the highest terms. From what I learned in my conversation with Elias Hatfield, I know that if anyone were to kill any one of his sons in a quarrel, he would kill the man who had committed the crime. He spoke several times of efforts that had been made against his son's life, and each time the resolute look came over his face, and he said, All that I want is to be let alone, but if people will persist in bothering and wronging those who are dear to me, why, let them look out. It was the son of this man whom I first heard of in reaching Logan Courthouse. I do not propose to burden this narrative with the story of my struggles in getting over the worst roads in the world. There was nothing for anyone to eat or drink, and few places where one would care to sleep. But in coming on to Logan Courthouse, I had hardly crossed the line when I met a group of men passing on rapidly up the road. There was one pale-faced man ahead. I asked him what was the row. Thar mout be a scrimmage going on down thar, said he, so I heard, but I reckon I wasn't very curious about that. So he passed on. As we went further and further along the road, I heard more about this scrimmage. Then I found that I had been within fifteen minutes' reach of a side of a Hatfield row. It was the usual brawl at election meeting. There had been a dispute about nothing, and Tom Hatfield had intervened as a peacemaker. Revolvers were drawn and one peacemaker, with a Winchester rifle, had taken up a position across the fence just opposite, while the candidates hastily took up positions in the background. Fortunately, the affair was settled in a moment, but for a time it looked as if Chapmansville was to be treated to a shooting match which might rival the affairs which have occurred from time to time at Logan Courthouse. Logan Courthouse Logan Courthouse is two days of the roughest riding from the railroad station that one would care to find. The roads are only a mere name. It is rare that you see a wagon upon them. The road constantly follows the bed of creeks and frequently fords deep streams. When the waters are up, the route is absolutely impassable. Days and weeks will pass without any more word coming from Logan Courthouse to the outer world than can be gotten out from Central Africa. Ants Hatfield, the celebrated leader of the family, lives fifteen miles from Logan Courthouse up the roughest road in the Island Creek region. It was a matter of some negotiation to obtain an interview with him, and that was the real object of my mission. No one had seen or described Ants Hatfield, his foreign and his guard of armed men, the talk and terror of the country. Ants Hatfield is universally regarded in this community in a favorable light. He possesses the extraordinary virtue of paying his debts, and a man who is financially honest in this country ranks so high that the mere fact of his having been guilty of a little peccadillo of murdering is not charged up against him, in a general estimate of his character. 
I was told that there are not over three men in the state of Virginia who can get to see him or be able to take a stranger to him. He is an able, intrepid, energetic mountaineer in the perfect prime of his physical vigor, a man who has sworn that he will never be taken alive. He is fifty years old and the father of twelve children, every one of them living. This is in contrast to the broken family of Randolph McCoy, who has five children, his large family having been murdered in this feud. The Lair of the Outlaw King John B. Floyd has been the representative of this community in both branches of the legislature for many years. He is an honest, courageous, and a fearless man, and has the absolute confidence of all the people in this region. While he sympathizes in no way with the Hatfields, they know that he would take no part in any detective scheme to capture them. He said the best way to see Hatfield was to go right to him and not to ask any permission. Elias Hatfield's son took the message to Ants the night before and announced our coming. Last Wednesday morning, in company with John B. Floyd and Clarence Moore of Charleston, we set out to visit the lair of the outlaw king. The road was much worse than that I had already traversed from Charleston to Logan Courthouse. The route lay over rocks, down through deep gorges, through the beds of streams constantly winding in and up, passing through such a sparsely settled region, only a few houses being seen on the 15-mile march. The first Hatfield outpost we saw was Elias Hatfield. He was going along the road with a heavy bag of cornmeal on his left shoulder. Behind him toddled a little girl, also carrying a bag. The man was prepared. Although he was carrying a very heavy bag upon his shoulder, he found it necessary to balance it with a long Winchester rifle in his right hand. With a rifle handy. He slowed up the moment he saw us. He saw us quite as soon as we saw him. He was a man of swarthy complexion and had the hooked nose of the Hatfield family. His dark face was slightly covered by a mustache and a short beard. He looked as wild as any ferocious game just started from the bush. He slipped his Winchester rifle along the line of his hip. As he did so, Mr. Floyd called out to him. Don't you know me, he said. Then Hatfield saw in a moment that it was a friend, and the movement with the rifle stopped. We now passed on to a small log mill on the banks of a noisy stream. There sat in the door of the mill as unprepossessing, unhung a villain as I have ever had the misfortune to see. He had a small, bullet head, frosty complexion, washed-out eyes, little pug nose, and great sandy mustache lying in the cruel, tightly nipped mouth. He balanced a Winchester across his lap. I learned afterwards that this was French Ellis, implicated in the house-burning attack. End of section 7section eight of an american vendetta this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org an american vendetta a story of barbarism in the united states by t c crawford chapter four part two ants hatfield at home before he could call out to us, Mr. Lloyd discovered Ants Hatfield in the field to the left. He called out to him and saved all questions from this sentry. Ants Hatfield came right over the field to us. He received us with boisterous hospitality. It was deeply interesting to witness the ardor and enthusiasm of the man receiving friends whom he knew didn't want him. Ants Hatfield is said by those who knew Stonewall Jackson to bear a marked resemblance to this noted Confederate general. He has a powerful frame, and is broad-shouldered and deep-chested, but with that curve to his shoulders that goes with all the mountain types that I have seen in this neighborhood. He wore a brown coat, blue shirt, and blue jean trousers tucked into high boots. He had a Colt's revolver in the holster, under his coat, and he carried a Winchester rifle in his right hand. This man is always spoken of in this neighborhood as industrious, and though awkward in look, he is intelligent and well-informed. Ants, although a man of fifty years of age, has not a gray line in the brown of his thick hair, mustache, and beard. He has a pair of gray eyes set under the deepest of bushy eyebrows. His nose is such an enormous hook as to suggest the lines of a Turkish scimitar. He wore a black hat, faded by long exposure to the weather, pulled down over a deeply lined forehead. He piloted us to his house and showed us in with marked courtesy and ease. As we entered the house, I noticed, beyond, two or three able-bodied men, armed with Winchester rifles, patrolling. His Primitive Dwelling 
As I entered the house, which is a log hut of only two rooms, I was shown to a seat in front of the great fireplace in which wood embers were smoldering. In this room there were four beds. On the beds were a formidable array of Winchesters. It looked like a small armory. In the black background there was a recumbent figure on the bed. As we entered, this figure sprang up to the floor, reached over in a moment, and, grasping a holster, began buckling it on with great rapidity. He was then heard to say with a slow drawl, Well, John B. Floyd, you kinder catched me off guard for once, didn't you? This was the notorious Cap Hatfield, the notorious son of Ants, a man who was charged with having the most vicious temper, the most cruel propensities in the whole Hatfield tribe. Cap Hatfield is directly charged by the community with having committed several murders. He is known to be quarrelsome and vindictive, and is believed to be capable of one of the common crimes of this community, of ambushing, meaning shooting a man from the bush. After the house burning, he absconded and went west. He also went to Texas, but he returned, not being able to remain away from the paradise of this mountain region, there being a popular prejudice concerning enemies of the law in the regions visited by him, which gave him a real homesick turn. The Outlaw's Family John's Hatfield, his brother, is away, and no one knows where he is. At the time of my talk, Ants Hatfield took the seat to the left of the fire, Cap Hatfield taking the seat to the right, and then the children swarmed in from all directions. There was a little toddler of two, a girl of four, and a young hero of six. He wore a long pair of gray trousers over his bare feet, and the upper part of his figure was covered by a ragged blue shirt. This youngster sat and listened to the tales of war told by his father, and eyed the rows of Winchesters lying in the background with a hungry look, as if he were eager for the time when he would grow up to become a useful member of the Society for the Extermination of People, obnoxious to the Hatfield interests. Cat Hatfield deserves a more detailed picture. I do not think that I ever saw a more hideously repulsive face in all my life on any human being. An Entertaining Cutthroat Ants Hatfield is a jovial old pirate. You can sit and talk with him, and perhaps enjoy for a time this conversation. He is bright and ready, with a good store of information. As a hunter, he is the most skillful horseman in this region. Cap Hatfield is simply a bad young man, without a single redeeming point. He has a slight frame, surmounted by a round ball head. His hair is dark, long, and has calmed down in a wavy line directly crossing his forehead and over his eyes. His right eye is a watery blue. His other has been disfigured by the explosion of a percussion cap, so that it gives him the appearance of being wall-eyed. His nose is a thick pug. His face is round, partially covered with an unkempt and stubby beard. A slight mustache conceals his coarse mouth. The whole expression of his face is very heavy. His chin constantly drops upon his breast, and he stares off into vacancy like a person disposed to melancholia. During my inquiries concerning the crimes alleged to have been committed by the Hatfield crowd, he had a way of shirking questions that came close home. When I talked with him, he spoke in a dialect which I will not attempt to reproduce. Pretending Ignorance of the Murders Ants Hatfield told the story of the murders, and charged them all upon murderous people of whom he knew nothing. He was not present at the murder of the three McCoys, and had not the slightest idea of who was responsible for the burning of the McCoy house. He said, very frankly, no man who were thar would tell anyone if he was. And so the matter dropped. Cap Hatfield kept interfering and giving his version. He was always ready to find names of people whom he believed were guilty, but they were names very remote from the Hatfield family. I asked the old gentleman a question, however, which brought out, in my judgment, very clearly whether he was responsible or not for the killing of the three McCoys who murdered Ellison Hatfield. I said, Mr. Hatfield, I want to ask you about your ideas about killing. There is no one in this community who has ever charged you with having killed anyone for the pleasure of it? No, he didn't believe they had. He wasn't that sort of a man. But, said I, if they were to kill any member of your family in a fair fight, what would you do? Well, I reckon, he said, I should get away with them just about as soon as I could. That is your idea, then? Yes, sir. Any man that wants to try it, he'll find it out. Now, what would you do if any detective came here and tried to take you? Well, now, I don't propose to be bothered any more. 
I have been out hiding in the brush. I have been kept away from my wife and babbies many and many a time. I do not like to be kept away from my babbies. Never means to be caught. This was said with a real sympathetic feeling. This is a characteristic of Vance Hatfield. The babbies were very much to him. They swarmed about him as he talked. I want this row settled, said he. It has gone on long enough. I intend to stay at my house, where I am, for the present. If the governor sends a proper requisition here for me in proper form, why, I wouldn't kill the man who brought it out. What would you do? Would you surrender? No, indeed, I wouldn't. I might possibly go out into the woods. I have been out there many a time, and I reckon nobody can catch me in these mountains. I simply will not be taken. How many men have you constantly on guard? Nine men. Dining with the Hatfields. The conversation was over a great deal of small gossip and neighborhood talk, and then we were invited out to dinner. We sat down to dinner in a little room at the back part of the house. Mrs. Hatfield, a stern-faced little woman with black eyes and black hair, stood up by the fire and beamed open hospitality upon the guests, handing from time to time various hot things that she brewed over the blaze. There were the regular corn pone, fried pork, snow-white butter, sweet potatoes, sliced tomatoes, and the hard beans of the mountains. It was a dinner for a hearty and extremely hungry man, but not much to tempt a fastidious appetite. It was served with such hospitality that one was forced to eat heartily, as the host from time to time showed burning anxiety to see his guests sit cold and eat something. After dinner, Ants insisted on our staying all night with him. Where he would have placed us was a mystery. There were twelve members of his family with him, and there were three grown-up young women and the nine guards, all of whom were to be placed in two small rooms. We escaped from this and walked down to the bank of the stream, where we had been invited to wash just before dinner. There various feats of marksmanship were exhibited. French Ellis here, for the first time, opened his mouth. His Highest Attribute Somebody spoke of a certain local light in shooting circles, and French Ellis exclaimed, with wild enthusiasm, Oh, he is a killer! Ants on our way back led us to the fort, which was down on the creek a quarter of a mile from the house. It is built solidly of logs, with openings cut through them for guns. The door is a heavy piece of oak six inches in thickness. This is the place, Ants says, that he has built for the time when he will be compelled to take refuge with the women and children and hold out in this fortress. It is beautifully situated for a fight. Everything about the place is conducted on military principles. The men under him actually act as if they were engaged in real war. Cat Patfield, in speaking of the situation, said, If this thing can only be settled, why, we would be willing to lay down our accoutrements and munitions of war. This is as military a declaration as Napoleon could have used. Yet this Hatfield crowd are not happy. They dare not sleep at night except in guarded places. They have sentries constantly out on guard. They dare not go around to the corner of the house to get a drink of water without a Winchester in hand. Suspicious of everybody. All during my talk with Cap Hatfield, I noticed one or two of the guards going out, prowling around with their revolvers. As much as they thought of John B. Floyd, if any suspicious stranger had appeared, I am certain that they would have made it of interest for their visitor. End of section 8「Section Nine of an American Vendetta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An American Vendetta, a story of barbarism in the United States by T. C. Crawford. Chapter Six, Part One. Devil Anse's Family Circle, a glimpse at the family fireside and how the outlaws lived. The picture presented inside the outlaw's hut is one which would need the careful accuracy of a photograph for reproduction so that its peculiar features could be believed. The principal room of the house was not much larger than the average hotel bedroom. The floor was bare. The principal feature of the room was an enormous blackened stone fireplace. In front of this was a brick hearth. At the right of the fireplace was a single bedstead. Then there was the door leading into the back part of the house, 
and across the narrow way going through the door were other beds there were three double beds in line at the opposite side of the room from the fireplace opposite the door already mentioned was the one leading out upon the front porch in a corner to the left of this floor was a big table and a broken-down old-fashioned sewing machine upon the table was a book it was the one book in the house it was a southern publication purporting to give a history of the united states from a casual glance at the chapters i learned for the first time that the southern confederacy triumphed and dictated terms to the united states government and was now in full possession of the government at washington i was informed that cap hatfield and one or two of the guards were the happy members of the family who had received enough education to pick out the meaning of an occasional sentence in this book in the family circle when Ants hatfield seated himself at the head of a semicircle in front of the fireplace and began to talk there was flanked at his right and left every member of his family the back part of the room was without a window and consequently in deep shadow from loose poles hanging along the ceiling were suspended various articles of clothing making patches of color against the dark background the most modest and quiet members of the family were the women there were three full-grown young women in this family and two younger daughters one just entering her teens and the other a little curly-haired girl of three years old the daughters were tall and broad-shouldered with lithe natural figures not one of which had ever felt the unnatural pressure of stays they were dressed in calico garments and without exception were barefooted one of the elder girls had regular features sparkling black eyes good color and a well-shaped head set off by a shock of uncombed dark brown hair they moved about with the gravity and ease of indian squaws they looked with much more indifference than curiosity upon the strangers who had for the time being taken possession and very much upset the routine of this household the scene presented when Ants hatfield began to discuss the feud was one well worthy of an artist's pencil the patriarch at the head of the dominating faction in this great vendetta himself a tall powerful man not showing as yet a single trace of the advance in years sat in an easy pose and talked with recklessness and the grace of an accomplished advocate at his right with his chin hanging upon his breast was cap hatfield the most pronounced type of the human murderer i have ever seen back of him sat several guards with their winchesters across their shoulders winchesters gleamed in every direction they were in rows across the beds and every now and then the door would open and in would stalk another tall mountaineer patrols were continually coming and going the children swarmed in and out while the three daughters clinging together after the fashion of the three graces would move in and out from the darkness of the rear room or would sit silent in the corner listening with apparent indifference to all that was being said the three visitors all wore overcoats and as we threw back our overcoats it was noticeable that the people we had come to see were nervous the throwing back of the coat of a stranger has to them a significance that it would not have to the average man even john b floyd's presence was not sufficient guarantee to produce a perfect feeling of confidence Aunt's Hatfield, who discussed many things, and all in a peculiar mountain dialect, was asked by me how it was that in so many of the mountain brawls shots were frequently fired to the number of fifty or sixty, and sometimes two hundred, without anyone being hit. I will tell you, said he, the human varmint is the most curious and most cunningest varmint there is when he goes into a fight he turns his body sideways so that there is presented for the bullet only four inches of life space and even that he doesn't hold up far and squar he just keeps a dodgin and friskin about and so when the bullets come along they don't find him that is the only way that i can account for it said he he spoke in a pleasant way of the mccoys and much regretted the quarrel but he knew of no way of settling it people had threatened his life and threatened the lives of his children and he swore over and over again in every form of emphatic phrase that he would kill those who touched any of his 
it was curious to notice the affectionate spirit developed by Anne's hatfield during this conversation for his children it might have been a good piece of dramatic acting but the old gentleman has often enough proved his devotion to his children he has been out on many a night raid the purposes of which were simply retaliation and punishment for some insult or injury done his children he is a man of intense pride he does not know how to read or write but he has lived the life of a mountaineer so long that he has imbibed such a spirit of freedom that he will not submit to the dictation of any one he is the absolute dictator of the family and the power of his dominating spirit is well illustrated by elias hatfield who told me that on the night that johnts hatfield was arrested he was in aunt's hatfield's house with his wife when the news came through rosanna mccoy of the capture of johns hatfield there was a hurried consultation ants called on all his followers and they all turned out but elias hatfield he thought that there might be trouble growing out of the raid and so he hesitated his wife whispering in his ear pleaded with him to stay at home but old ants called out imperiously come with me or you are no hatfield and so that man of peace rather than submit to that turned out to follow the fiery leader who swept away in the night and succeeded in accomplishing the object of his mission i asked Anne hatfield if he was not a religious man because it is not uncommon to find in connection with these mountain families strong religious belief in connection with the performance of acts of a criminal character Anne replied i belong to no church unless you say that i belong to the one great church of the world if you like you can say it is the devil's church that i belong to at this he roared as if he had perpetrated a joke and all the family joined in as if the wit of this father outlaw was something too exquisite for belief Anne hatfield spoke of his virtues he said that he had never told any lies this has been verified by his neighbors he tells no lies about himself when he says that he does not know about certain killings it is because he has taken great pains not to know he scrupulously pays his debts he is hospitable to people in his class it is related of him that he once gave a dinner to a detective but it must be borne in mind that this detective was a west virginia one and was not engaged in hunting the hatfields but rather the mccoys across the river but the special virtue claimed by Anne hatfield for himself was this he said people have given me a reputation of being fond of killing people now i am not a quarrelsome man all that i want is to be let alone if i were a killer and disposed to be revengeful there is many a man that i would have picked off from the brush if i felt so inclined when i lived on tug river why sir i have been a hunter and a trapper for years i have tracked many a bar and deer over this country i know every foot of it i have been out in the woods for days and weeks at a time i have got many a dry rocky nook in the mountains where no man living could find me but don't you suppose in those days when they was hunting me down tug river way that i had plenty of opportunities when i was under snug cover to pick off every day some one of the men who were after me but i didn't do it simply because none of them had as yet done anything to me the fact that they were trying to was nothing cap hatfield as i have said before dominates to a great extent his father either this is the fact or his father finds him a very useful tool for carrying out his purposes cap hatfield has the reputation of being a coward in addition to being one of the most brutal criminals who has ever escaped justice but his father shows him a deference that he shows to no other of his children during the dinner which we had at his house cap hatfield beguiled and passed away the time by telling us the various places that he had visited in the north and west when he thought the officers of the law were after him he described how he left the country and from this description it is easy to understand how difficult it would be to capture any of these outlaws by people not familiar with this territory cap hatfield left home in such a way that he walked for five days through the mountain country outside the line of all roads and when he came to strike the railroad he did it at one of the most remote parts upon it from the place of his starting 
like all illiterate men he had a wonderful memory for names and dates in giving the places where he stopped he always mentioned the name of the house the date of his arrival and generally the name of the landlord who kept the house i am familiar with the touching example of maternal pride in the well-doing of a son but i do not think i ever saw a more lofty look of maternal pride on any mother's face than shone out upon the swarthy dark face of mrs hatfield when she listened to her son cap as he told the story of how he had dodged the officers and of the various devices employed by him to escape them one day in texas he thought he was done for he saw a man from his neighborhood whom he knew very well although he was not certain whether the man knew him he knew no way of solving this doubt better than going right up to the man and asking his name this was the plan he employed to force the other to show his hand so loosening a pistol in his pocket he walked up to him and said what is your name the man replied vaughn hatfield knew that this was false and then through the magic of this false name his courage rose high again for he said to himself this man being under a false name has undoubtedly run away too for some such reason as i have so he announced himself to this man calling him by his right name his instinct of a hunted criminal proved to be correct the man whom he had met was another murderer from his county who had been forced temporarily to leave cap hatfield then related how intimate they became and added he took a heap of interest in me when he found that i was in the same fix as he and did everything he could to help and protect me but this wanderer could find no place to stay the money which had enabled him make his trip came from a sale of land given to him by his father on tug river the amount was eight hundred dollars when he had travelled about and exhausted this sum he of course returned home because he is too indolent to work and nowhere found any section of the country where he could enjoy the same freedom as in the mountains of west virginia End of section 9section 10 of an american vendetta this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org an american vendetta a story of barbarism in the united states by t c crawford chapter 6 part 2 cap hatfield gave another story of himself which is fully corroborated by his father which illustrates very well the character and style of entertainment given in this part of the country careful people never attend any of the rare religious gatherings in the small schoolhouses throughout the country for the reason that these meetings so often break up in shooting matches cap hatfield's first great adventure the one which i have just referred to occurred at a dance which was given at logan court house he arrived upon the scene in company with a dozen or more mountaineers with their girls a half hour too late they found the floor of the room engaged by them occupied by a dr reese doctor seems to be a common term among the mountaineers for those of their associates who have any knowledge of herbs this doctor was called upon by cap hatfield to surrender the room he said no that they were there first and that the others could dance the following evening of course there was only one result that could follow cap hatfield drew his revolver but the doctor was too quick for him he shot him through the two hips and the youngster who was soon to become noted as the most bloodthirsty and relentless of the murderers of these mountains fell and was so paralyzed that he could not continue firing it was the intention of the doctor to advance and complete his work this appears to be one of the irresistible attractions about a shooting match when a mountaineer's blood is once up and he has got his man down he is merciless and does not consider his work complete until he has put his gun against his fallen enemy's head and blown his brains out but the friends of hatfield crowded between and drove back the doctor Anse hatfield got out his winchester loaded it carefully loaded his revolver and then turned his attention to his son he attended him himself and according to his own story did not take off his clothes for thirty days then cap got well and was able to be about this fact freed dr reese 
there was no complaint ever made against him before the local authorities and Anse hatfield said let him go he did not kill so i've got nothing to say if he had killed my boy i should have killed him to make it square but as it is my boy was in the wrong in the first place and this little prickin don't hurt him any there is nothing in which Anse hatfield takes more pride than his fort he called on his neighbors to assist him in building it it is exactly six logs in height its ceiling consists of loose fitting poles perhaps four inches in diameter over them is a sharp pointed roof of heavy shingles i suggested to cap hatfield that the bullets could come through the shingles very easily but he at once explained how no bullet fired through the shingles could touch those inside in the first place in order to shoot down through the shingles one would have to be considerably above the house and then the bullets would simply glance into the loose poles the only article of furniture in the fort is an old mattress filled with feathers there is an open fireplace large enough for cooking purposes it was upon this pallet that wild bill lay after he was shot in the heel by the kentucky detectives during our visit i do not remember anything more dramatic and more striking than the disarming of cap hatfield the principal outlaw by john b floyd floyd is a very powerful man and he told me he believed that he could bring in the whole outfit of the outlaws alone if he felt so inclined it was during our visit by the side of the stream that floyd walked up in an aimless sort of way till he reached the vicinity of cap hatfield and then like a flash his hand went into his holster and he had his pistol out before hatfield knew what was being done then cap made a rush and seized him by the wrist but floyd shook him off in a second the younger hatfield smiled as if he regarded the whole thing as a joke but a very poor kind of a joke he said no man ever did that there before and you bet your life no man will ever catch me again that way the manners of the hatfields are of the most primitive kind such an article as soap is absolutely unknown in the history of the family the guests just before dinner are invited to wash in a passing stream about twenty feet from the house one towel about the size of an ordinary circular was furnished for three men there was a little tin wash basin by the side of the creek furnished on account of the visitors but the hatfields themselves washed directly in the brook the men women and children of this family and the guards all sleep in the same room i am told by those who have had night quarters in the houses where both sexes swarm to such a degree that there are as much modesty and decency observed as if each person had a separate room the men are generally seated about the fire and ignore according to the etiquette of the place the retiring of the women folks to their pallets the girls go to bed first and they are always up first in the morning each member of the family is divided off from the other by a winchester in order to get the exact pronunciation of this word as it is used in this neighborhood you want to pronounce it with a very long drawl and the accent on the second syllable Anse hatfield was very much interested in the objects of my visit mr floyd explained to him first that i was very anxious to have the hatfield mccoy feud settled and that was the real reason of my coming there he did not seem to understand exactly what a newspaper was he had never heard of a single one of the new york newspapers and only very vaguely of new york he said that he had heard that it was a very pretty country down there appearing to imagine that it was another section of the green mountain briar patch in a land very remote from any place known by him he never was in a large town in his life and has no more idea of what goes to make up the life of a great city than the wildest savage of the plains i explained to him something of the character of new york and told him that he could make a great deal more money down there than he could by hiding in the brush in the mountains why i said after my story about you has been published in the world you can come down to new york with your son dressed just as you are carrying your winchester and revolvers and be placed on exhibition i am sure you could get at least five hundred dollars a week such a fabulous sum as this made the eyes of the chief outlaw fairly open wide with amazement 
he showed some of the qualities however of a business man for he instantly replied well now see here i want to make a bargain with you when this here hatfield mccoy feud is settled i want to come down to new york and if you will get me that thar engagement why i'll give you half i get out of it but it is no use of talking about it now them thar varmints of the officers of the law would not like any better chance than to catch me outside of these yar mountain lines and there is not enough money anywhere to tempt me to put myself within their reach aunt hatfield may well consider himself safe from the officers of the law it is probable that every one of the hatfields visited by me will go down some day from the bullet of an enemy but it is not remotely probable that any one of them will be punished for his many crimes in any legal way there is some apparent justification for the acts of such an outlaw as Anse hatfield he is an energetic soldierly man who served all through the confederacy and who learned in that war his first disregard for the taking of life when he returned to this community he found it just as he left it the law officers are officers in mere name it would not have been possible for him at the time of the killing of his brother ellison hatfield to have obtained any punishment for the three mccoys who set upon him and cut him till he fell mortally wounded so taking that view it is not hard to understand how Anse hatfield organized a band of executioners to punish the three men who without reason and spurred on by the rage of a petty quarrel over the most trivial of subjects attacked and killed a man whose sole fault was that he was trying to make peace and to prevent the quarrel from reaching serious consequences End of section ten. Section 11 of An American Vendetta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vicki VM. An American Vendetta. A Story of Barbarism in the United States by T.C. Crawford. Chapter 7. There is much more to be said of the strange, half-civilized natives who live in the blood-stained wilderness along the mountainous boundary of Kentucky and West Virginia than I told in the previous chapter. I have given the story of the murderous warfare that has been carried on for a quarter of a century between the Hatfields and McCoys as I learned it from the lips of the leading spirits in the endless feud but the story of the daily life of these barbaric mountaineers their family relations and their social customs makes a chapter astonishing and unparalleled when we first set out for the home of aunts hatfield we took horses we had first a mountain guide who did not know absolutely anything on any subject he did not even know the roads he was putty-faced with stupid blue eyes, and his imbecile countenance was set off by a short yellow beard and a long mustache. He was dressed in a suit of gray. He was selected by the landlord. For what particular reason, I do not know. He was the most free and easy specimen of American citizen I have ever had the pleasure of employing. He was supposed to be a guide who was familiar, not only with the roads, but with the mountain people. The first thing he did was to walk up and choose the best horse of the four selected by the landlord for our party. After he had mounted that, I handed to him a little bag which I desired to take with me. Although he had been engaged for the sum of one dollar a day to serve me, he immediately kicked at the idea of carrying any bag. He said he was not used to waiting upon people in any such fashion as that. He was willing to go along for company for a dollar a day. But if I wished to put upon him the ignominy of carrying that bag, I would have to pay him fifty cents a day more. So I was forced to yield to the demands of this mountain scoundrel. We set out on our dismal journey in single file. The villagers watched us with as mournful an air as if we were going to a funeral. 
I had a comfortable gray mare whose side had been kicked out by her stable companion. Mr. Floyd had a dark brown horse, and my friend Mr. Moore had a heavy bay. We filed down from the village, down steep banks, across the Guyandot, which comes into this place. There is no bridge even across this wide stream. We met numerous mountaineers wading across, carrying their shoes on their shoulders. Other people were coming and going in great numbers on account of the court, which was then in session. I soon became convinced that it would be impossible to make the trip this way. I had already been riding for two or three days and was so overcome with malarial fever, which I had contracted in the bottoms, that I was unable to endure the fatigue of this style of marching, particularly as our guide was stupid, idiotic, and had to be constantly watched and checked. He seemed to think that Mr. Moore of our party was a particular object for his derision, and every move he made, although he is one of the best writers in the state, was the subject of a derisive haw 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 from this simple child of nature, I am sure that if we should have marched with him two or three miles, the spirit of Logan County would have seized upon some of us, and there might have been a death charged up against us. But we returned after the first half mile, dismissed him, put away the curious crows of horses which had been furnished us, and obtaining a steady pair and an ordinarily good wagon, one which we had used in coming over from Logan Courthouse, we made the ascent in that way. The road is so wild and rough going from Logan Courthouse to Devil Ants' Fort that it would be impossible to march any body of men through there so as to reach the outlaw. The roads wind in and out, and at nearly every turn was a mountaineer who, although engaged apparently in agricultural pursuits, yet actually was a guard. At the appearance of a stranger, signals passed up the road, whistles would be heard, strange cries, signals passing from one neighborhood to another. In case of emergency, a mountaineer can always make shortcuts through the forest and anticipate the coming of travelers by any of the regular roads. Mr. Moore, who was with me, told me that the mountaineers in this neighborhood possess wonderful and peculiar facilities for obtaining information. He said it was almost impossible to serve them with any process of court. He is connected with the United States Court at Charleston. He said he had frequently prepared writs in his office, which he had mentioned to no one but a confidential officer sent out to serve them. This officer would ride straight from the town after the writ being given him directly to the mountain country where the person desired was living, only to find in the majority of cases that he had already received notice of the officer's coming and had disappeared. End of section 11. Recording by Vicki V.M. Section 12 of An American Vendetta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An American Vendetta, a story of barbarism in the United States by T.C. Crawford. Chapter 8. The incidents of the Hatfield-McCoy feud are few in the history of the lawless acts which can be charged against the community living to the east and west of Tug River. The feud between these two families lends a picturesque and dramatic interest to their acts, and much more importance has been attached to this petty war than it really deserves. It will be seen by a scrutiny of the summary of the crimes given above that the reports concerning their number have been much exaggerated, but the incidental crimes connected with this feud are much more numerous. In the region I have named, there is absolutely no punishment for the crime of murder except that of personal retaliation. James L. Dodson, a justice of the peace at Jamboree, Pike County, Kentucky, 
told me during the course of a long conversation on the subject that he had lived twenty-five years in that region and had carefully observed the conduct of judicial affairs. I asked him if during that time he had ever known of any judicial punishment for murder. He said, not once during the twenty-five years. This is equally the history of the counties on the opposite side of the river in West Virginia. Mr. Dodson said that he had never taken part in any of the local quarrels, but that he had become wearied at last of this continued violation of the law, and he intended to move away and become a member of some other community. Mr. Dodson says also that Mr. Phillips, the deputy who made the raid into West Virginia, is a man who started out honestly, but who misconceived his duties, and was led into the perpetration of crimes even worse than those he was seeking to punish. During the few days that I stayed in the neighborhood of Logan Courthouse, I saw a number of brawls. Mountaineers come down to political meetings and to sessions of the courts, for these are the only amusements in this faraway region. Each candidate has to furnish a jug of whiskey for the meeting if he wishes to have any popularity at all. Logan is nominally a prohibition town, and as a necessary consequence, there is sold throughout its length and breadth the vilest liquor known to the trade. Towards the latter part of the day, at the political or the court gatherings, there is the usual beastly drunkenness. This is a fashionable piece of relaxation. I do not know how many times I have heard one mountaineer accost another with, What did you come in for today? And the answer would be invariably, To see my friends and get drunk. In a community where the intellectual grade is so low, physical prowess counts for everything. The big man of the community is the bully, and where one has not the strength physically, he generally makes up for the lack by the handy use of what they call weapons. A blow is nearly always followed by the drawing of a knife or a revolver. The disputes are always, or nearly always, about the most trivial subjects. The other night I saw the power of a man of might. Several of us were seated about the open fire in the little office of the hotel of the town. A tall, drunken individual, over six feet in height, came in and looked about for a seat. He was too fatigued to be able to stand for more than a moment, so he selected his victim in the shape of an undersized mountaineer who was half asleep in the corner. He backed around in his neighborhood and then deliberately sat down upon him with a thud that would have crushed an ordinary man. The little man simply struggled out of the way of the giant and said nothing. The people generally here are hospitable and civil. The stranger is welcomed to their doors. If he can eat corn pone, fried pork, and fried chicken, he is welcome to their table. But throughout the community you never hear anyone denounce the crime of murder. I believe the majority of the people here are peaceably inclined, but are overawed and domineered by the bullying element. There is a very large lawless class throughout the mountains, people who live irregular, immoral lives. I do not believe there is any such place for missionary work in the whole world as in this region. There is not a Catholic institution in the entire neighborhood. The few preachers who struggle through here are uneducated, ignorant, hard-shell Baptists and Methodists. Women of the dissolute class are very large, considering it is a rural community. These women, in the picturesque language of the mountains, are called idle women. They are responsible for many of the quarrels and the murders which darken the history of these mountain regions. It will not do to say that this is a new community and that these are the faults common to every undeveloped section. It is one of the oldest settled sections of the country. It is also one of the richest in natural resources. There are no finer coal deposits anywhere than are to be found in Logan County and this neighborhood. But the community has not progressed for upward of a hundred years. 
Its schools are few and primitive. The principal mountaineers do not know how to read or write. A man who reads a book is regarded as a preacher. In spite of their lack of the ordinary comforts of civilization and their isolation from the world, they all have the exaggerated egotism and comfortable opinion of their surroundings common to provincial communities. Here, freedom is asserted to its uttermost. Privacy is unknown. That any sane man should want a room to himself in a hotel, or that he should have a prejudice against anyone sleeping with him, is something beyond the calculation of the genial hosts of this neighborhood. At the hotel where I stopped in Logan Courthouse, I succeeded with difficulty in persuading the landlord to give up one room to myself and a friend traveling with me. But after securing the room, the great problem was how to keep it. The entire community swarmed into it whenever they liked and as they liked. Unfortunately, it was on the ground floor and in easy range. Sometimes the informal caller would come in through the window, but he generally would walk in to the number of five and six by the door, never by any chance knocking, never by any chance making the slightest excuse for his genial presence. Locking the door simply produced a coldness in the community and a suspicion that we were detectives hatching plans to carry off some of their leading citizens. Then there was a deaf and dumb idiot who was the pet of the village. He had a face like a ghoul and a resounding consumptive cough that was like the cry of death from a moldy tomb. This ghoul-like face was always at one of the windows of my room. This deaf and dumb horror was always following strangers. I will never forget one day when three Kentucky visitors walked in and produced a bottle of sour mash. They introduced themselves solemnly to me by name and asked me if I would take a drink. I excused myself upon the plea that I was so filled up with the malaria of the country that I had no room for anything else. A book in my hand saved me from the wrath of these invaders. "'Can't you see, Bill?' said one of them. "'He's a preacher. "'Preachers like a drink, same as anybody else, "'but it's again the rules of their church to drink "'unless they are by themselves.' "'With this, the invader of my would-be exclusive room "'beckoned the deaf and dumb idiot "'who had been hovering on the porch, "'and he sprang through the window like an animal.' and before they could more than indicate their desire to have even this poor creature drink with them on a footing of equality, the ghoul had actually swallowed fully a pint of their whiskey. It was with difficulty wrenched from him. As they walked out, the misshapen idiot, more cheerful than ever, took a seat upon my hearthstone and announced by his manner that he never would leave me but an open door and a little muscular assistance made him change his mind. It is a region which develops eccentricity of character and excessive independence of thought. I know one veteran here, a captain who commanded a company of soldiers during the war, and that man today feels perfectly confident that he knows more about military science than any man who ever lived. He told me that he gave up the Confederacy in 1862, and he came very near telling Jeff Davis that it was no use to go on. Something restrained him from thus checking the advance of the southern armies. I do not know what it was. I am sure it was not modesty or any lack of belief in himself. The last character that I noticed in this town was a fine, hale old man with forty or fifty different colored rags sewn on the top of a black hat. He gravely announced to me that he was Grover Cleveland, and that he felt perfectly confident that he was going to carry Logan County by a large majority, and consequently the state. I tried to leave this charming region in a pleased state of mind. The mere thought of going ought to have been ecstasy beyond description, but as I was moving away, this foul fiend of the deaf and dumb description 
came sweeping down, and before I knew it, had actually embraced me in a passion of regret at my departure. The one bright and marked incident of the trip was the feat of Clarence Moore of Charleston in that state, as handsome and broad-shouldered an athlete as I have ever seen. He was with me in the World's Express, which was toiling over rock, boulder, and tree trunk at the rate of not quite four miles an hour, when the two wheels of our feeble wagon deliberately smashed. He saw a look of despair upon my face, because going ahead without delay meant my being able to make New York connection in time to get home for the Sunday World's publication. He was out of the wagon like a flash. With a quick turn of his hand, he slipped off the rattle-trap harness from the miserable old horse on the offside, and in a second he disappeared, clubbing it furiously up the road, telling me as he departed that he was going to catch a drummer who was only two miles ahead, that he would make him pull me through. He succeeded, and to him is due a debt of gratitude, for not having swallowed a morsel of wholesome food for nearly ten days, and having had nearly six days continuous riding over the road to this region, I had reached the limit of my ability to live the life of a mountaineer. End of section 12. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 13 of An American Vendetta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An American Vendetta. A Story of Barbarism in the United States by T. C. Crawford. Chapter 9. A visit to this neighborhood will give one an exact idea of the difficulties encountered by our forefathers in traveling through the country before the days of the railroads and the telegraph. The roads are nearly in a state of undisturbed nature. There has been a very small amount of taxes or labor expended upon their improvement. After the first fifteen miles leaving Charleston, there is not a single rod of good road. The rider, whether in wagon or on horseback, is in constant pain from jolting, bumping, and sliding over the rocks and down steep inclines, and soon becomes worn out with the never-ending fatigues of these most difficult of roads. The first stop made was at Racine. This is the best place upon the road, but here there are only the most primitive of accommodations. The fare is coarse harsh and particularly repulsive to one whose stomach has been thoroughly upset by the pounding of the ride. There is never a thing on any of the tables which appeals to anything but the coarsest of appetites. They have in these mountains an unattractive kind of bean which they cook in the pods, making a stew which is greatly relished by the mountaineers. I never have seen a stranger able to eat any of this mess. The meat is always poor. Pork, fried in its own grease, is served in a bowl with little thin scraps of meat floating in a perfect pond of melted fat. An occasional fried chicken we found was fried until all its juice was taken from it, and then it was loaded down with grease, making it perfectly impossible to eat. It was at Racine that I saw the star route man, the mails are carried through here on horseback. The little star route carrier said the horses were ill-fed and were incapable of making over twenty miles a day. The people are supposed to be very hospitable. When we were not in the neighborhood of a regular stopping place, as often happened, the custom of the country would be to drive up in front of a house and call out, Hello! To this appeal there would come a response from the house, and then would follow a conversation. Can you care for so many men and so many beasts? The answer would be sometimes favorable and sometimes not. I remember one night, when the fogs in the mountains swept down, 
chilling me to the very marrow, of riding mile after mile, trying house after house, until finally we reached one place where the host balanced on his foot for nearly ten minutes before he could make up his mind to let us come in. I never realized before the feelings of a homeless outcast and the humble feeling of gratitude that filled my heart because this mountaineer finally grudgingly allowed us to fight our way through his army of dogs to his fireside was something that I could never have imagined I could have felt under any circumstances. And yet I do not wonder that these people were reluctant to take us in. They had retired for the night. They were hard-working people. They were up every morning at 5.30, and our coming in meant simply a loss of two or three hours' sleep, because if they once take you into their house, then they will fulfill all the rights of hospitality. In spite of all protests, the women of the house arose as soon as we entered and proceeded to cook us a hot supper. The intention was so good that it quite made us forget the grudging admission of ourselves by the host. In one or two places where I stopped, pay was refused, but in only one or two places. The Hatfield people, for instance, would not take any pay, and were rather incensed that anything should be offered them for the entertainment which they furnished us when we were at the outlaw's house. I remember that Mr. Floyd offered one of the Hatfield little boys half a dollar for his bringing up the team. The little boy flushed to the roots of his hair and looked perfectly indignant. I do not believe he had ever had so much money in his life offered him, and it is very doubtful whether he had ever had anything like it in his possession. He looked appealingly at his father, and his father said, Well, Floyd's an old friend, and you can take it. Logan Courthouse, during a session of the court, presents a picture which is a duplicate of all court sessions throughout the petty towns of this benighted region. The place is about as large as Pike Town, and is very similar in character. There is a little, long, straggling street of frame houses, small shops and stores coming down to a square brick court building to which is attached the jail. The people come to court not because they have any business there, but to simply meet their friends and to go on a spree. You will see up and down the street people exchanging gossip, sitting down in the sun telling stories, or making preparations for the glorious fun of getting drunk in the afternoon. They are always very friendly in the morning and quarrelsome in the afternoon, but they all unite in one thing, in a cordial suspicion and hatred of all strangers. The stranger who walks during the latter part of the day through one of these court towns, when everybody is well fired up with liquor, simply places himself in the way of insult and a quarrel. The mountaineers never close the day in one of these gatherings without some sort of a fight. If they cannot have it with a stranger, they are quite ready to fight among themselves. Men who have been lifelong friends will quarrel about the height of a horse, the weight of a pig, or who is the best shot in the county. From high words they soon pass to blows, and then out comes the inevitable pistol or knife. The minute the pistol appears, the friends of both sides promptly take positions, and then there comes firing all along the line. It is a common thing to hear pistol shots in the street during these gatherings. There was not a day passed when I was at Logan Courthouse that I did not hear several pistol shots during the evening gatherings, but no one was hurt or even hit while I was there. Late each night, during the court week, the town was given up to absolute orgy. The mountaineers, perfectly wild with drink, paraded up and down the streets with the dissolute women from the woods who took possession of the courthouse itself and held it each night against the officers of the law. This building, although locked repeatedly, was broken into each night and the officers of the law were too feeble to protect it from the use of this drunken, dissolute, fighting, murderous crowd. 
the dissolute mountain women who take part in these hideous brawls and night fights are the most revolting-looking women I have ever seen in my life. They are nearly all of them snuff-dippers. I saw two in Logan Courthouse last Monday morning who fairly represented the types of the worst class of this human animal. One had slow black eyes, a small nub of a nose, and a round, fat face. Her mouth was large and coarse, and when she laughed, it disclosed a row of black stubs of teeth. Her hair was oiled with grease until it fairly dripped, and was combed straight down in Indian-like bangs between her black, beady eyes. Her face was daubed right and left with red and white paint. It was put on on top of the dirt of years which had accumulated on her countenance, which had certainly never been washed from the day of her birth. On top of her head she wore a crazy basket straw hat loaded down with artificial flowers the size of small cabbages and colored with the most crude of dyes. Her dress was a flaming blue calico without fit or shape and which descended but a little way below her knees. Beneath this dress were displayed coarse woolen stocking and men's shoes. She and a blonde of the same type, who wore a pink calico dress and who was even more hideous, if anything, than her associate, the two smoking long-stemmed pipes, spitting and swearing, stormed up and down the town, two she-devils it would be hard to match in any other part of the world. Some of the mountaineers who were with them had certain prepossessing qualities. Most of the mountaineers have good figures, and some of them have very fine faces. Sober, you will often find them reasonable and fairly good talkers. But these women, sober or drunk, are the most vicious, the most hideous, the most repulsive creatures I have ever seen in my life. But even the best of the mountaineers seemed to find them attractive, and wherever these two foul fiends of women went, smoking and sputtering with their pipes, they were followed by a crowd of howling men who were ready to fight to the death for the privilege of the company of these creatures who had the mere semblance of women. There is little more to be said about this country. It has no law which can be enforced. The representatives of the law hold the places merely for the petty salaries connected therewith, and never, under any circumstances, attempt to enforce any of its provisions. The few feeble attempts which have been made to punish murder in this part of West Virginia have been directed entirely against the inhabitants of the state of Kentucky, the same can be said concerning the authorities of Pike County, Kentucky. There are no newspapers circulated throughout the district. You see an occasional weekly newspaper. No one ever has any books. There is absolutely no recreation except that of getting drunk and fighting. The great missionary societies, which are devoting so many sums to the establishment of missions abroad, could well afford to turn their attention towards this outlaw land where murder reigns supreme, where the rule of the man of might is absolute, and where justice and the common comforts of modern civilization are absolutely unknown. End of Section 13 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 14 of An American Vendetta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An American Vendetta A Story of Barbarism in the United States by T. C. Crawford. Chapter 10. Since returning from the wilds of Murderland along the border of West Virginia and Kentucky, I have been asked by many people who know this country how I could possibly have ventured to go into such a desperate region. 
J. Brisbane Walker of Colorado, who has made a fortune in the West and who intends to settle down in New York to enjoy it while he educates his boys, lived for a number of years in West Virginia. Mr. Walker is a man of the most wide and varied experience. When a mere youth, he was taken from West Point by Burlingham and appointed by him to a high position in the Chinese army. Mr. Walker saw active service in China and since has been in the most lawless parts of the West during the developments of the last ten years. He regards the West Virginia regions as much more dangerous to strangers than any other place he has ever seen. He said to me, You do not appear to realize where you have been. Why, with my knowledge of the situation there, I would not go over the ground you have and talk with the people you did for $50,000 in cash. Your life was in danger every moment after you passed into the Hatfield region. The fact that you were with a man who was well known to them would have counted as nothing if their suspicions had by chance been directed against you. That they were not is simply a miracle. You were lucky, that is all. But that does not change the fact of the immense risk you ran. I have found Mr. Walker's opinion echoed by many others who know this West Virginia country. I am beginning to realize what I did not in the benumbed state I was in from the constant hammering of the mountain roads and from the dullness that creeps over one when he has been five or six days without food, that there is danger in murder land and that investigation of the murderous ways of this barbarous country might lead one to find nothing more interesting than a bullet from the bush. The morning after my arrival at Logan Courthouse, I learned of the misadventures of a New York newspaper correspondent who had come into this country several days ahead of me. The night of his arrival, he was waited on by a committee who wanted to know what he was doing in the town. The line of their inquiries produced such an impression upon the visitor's mind that he left town the next morning at seven o'clock. He was in such a hurry that he would not wait until noon when he could have obtained a horse. Such was his haste to get out of Murderland before any other committee could call upon him that he left on foot. I heard of him several times afterwards from the mountaineers, who soon learned to regard him as a detective. Everybody knows all there is to know about any visiting strangers. Anse Hatfield had heard of this correspondent. He asked me about him and if I knew him. I was obliged to answer in the negative. That was enough for Anse Hatfield. The man had said he was from New York, and here was another man from New York who did not know him. No greater proof was necessary to show that the first comer was a detective. It will not do to assume that there is no punishment for the murderers in this country. The Hatfields, who are the most successful of the killers on the east side of the Tug River, live in constant terror of their lives. Their eyes are constantly rolling about, searching for someone who is after them. They hardly dare sleep for fear the bullet of some friend or relative of their many victims may come to make their sleep eternal. It is very difficult to get any expressions of opinion from even the best people in this section of the country favoring the punishment of people who commit the crime of murder. Even when you obtain opinions from the people of adjoining southern states, you find the sentiment very similar to that of this neighborhood. I met a Virginia judge during my visit here. He came in for the purpose of buying land. It was really refreshing to talk with this judge and to obtain his view of social ethics. In the first place, this Virginia judge believes in the duello. He says it is the only way quarrels can be settled between gentlemen. I asked him what that line of argument proved. I said, suppose the wrong man goes down. He turned on me and said he didn't expect anybody from the North to comprehend his line of argument, that the institution was one which was peculiarly Southern. But, said I to him, 
the duello is even passing away with you. He admitted the truth of this, at the same time expressing his sorrow for the fact. This Virginia judge admitted with great frankness that the Negro votes in the state of Virginia were not counted, and that the whites had practically disfranchised the blacks. He said that as a judge, he would unhesitatingly send a man to prison who should be brought before him and convicted of such illegal counting, but as an individual and a man, he approved of such a course. He also believes in the shotgun settlement of insults and to avenge domestic honor. He thinks that they are not cases to be tried in courts at all. This opinion of this Virginia judge represents the higher southern view in Virginia and in Kentucky. I have been told that there are any number of mountain districts in Virginia equally as wild as the district I have just visited. The general carrying of arms by southern men must have very much to do with the violent and murderous quarrels which break out from time to time in the South. In Washington, the other day, I had my attention called to the fact that there is no southern man, however high in rank or position, who may not belong to the class of men who carry concealed weapons. At the hotel where I was in Washington, there was a very prominent southern official. He holds one of the highest offices under the government. He is also one of the best paid. He is a great favorite with the president and is a man who had a distinguished record in the Confederate service during the war. He is a man of ability and, as the world goes, of good character. Yet, underneath his veneering of civilization, there dwells the spirit of barbarism which transforms this polite, well-mannered gentleman into a savage. He has the habit of going off on periodical fits of drunkenness, and when he is in this condition, he is dangerous. When I was in Washington, he had been drunk in his room for three days and had not been near his office. His wife, becoming alarmed at his continued intemperance, sent for some friends to come and disarm him, as she did not think he should have weapons in his possession while he was in such a condition. There was, taken from the person of this distinguished official, a huge Colt's revolver, half as long as his arm, and two great bowie knives. I make no comment on the three days' drunkenness, because some of the distinguished officials from the North have a habit of going off at times to relax themselves from the severe strain of their public duties. But what was this official doing with a great revolver and two big knives? It is possible that he was connected with some vendetta and that his life had been threatened. The carrying of concealed weapons is a common thing among Southern members, but of course it is by no means as common as the carrying of weapons among the common people of the South. In Logan County, I do not think there is any man so poor who could not afford to have a Winchester rifle. It is regarded in every household as an indispensable article of domestic furniture. Revolvers and knives are found in every house as a matter of course. The theory of their being in the possession of everyone is based upon the fact that the law is not enforced and the courts are powerless to protect the inhabitants. There is much more in this phase of the Southern question than has ever been advanced against the South. Concerning the Negroes, that is an affair which the Southern people will have to regulate for themselves. That is not an affair in which the government can interfere. But there is no doubt that there are numerous sections in the South where just such scenes of violence and lawlessness are perpetrated as I have found in the southwest of Virginia. There is now going on a vendetta in northern Alabama. Kentucky is noted throughout its borders for its family quarrels. They shoot as freely in Georgia and South Carolina as they do in Virginia. While there may be no more murders perpetrated in proportion to the population than in the North, there is no doubt that the killing in the South is done by a different grade of people, by people who, in the North, 
are classed as respectable and well-to-do. There does not appear to be any distinct criminal class who commit murder for profit or money. The murders are those resulting from personal quarrels. The Hatfield crowd have been the most successful of all the outlaws in the South. The reason of this is that they are isolated from all railroad communication and are so strongly fortified in the mountains. Their women are faithful slaves who work for them without questioning any of their edicts. They seem to regard the men as heroes and that whatever they do is perfectly right. Mrs. Hatfield, the wife of Aunt Hatfield, is one of the strongest and most muscular-looking women I've ever seen, she has intensely black hair, a very broad, swarthy face, and a stout, powerful figure. She is the mother of twelve children, every one of whom she has successfully raised. There has never been a funeral in this family. The mother is as hard as iron. She does not know how to read or write, and never even saw a railroad. She has no more idea of what is right and wrong than a mastiff dog. She has always lived in this wild country, where the men are the absolute masters, and during the last twenty-five years she has been a contented and prosperous wife of one of the most desperate fighters and most successful hunters of this region. She is as devoted to him and his reputation as is the wife of the most distinguished general. This country, which is now dominated and controlled by as lawless a class of people as is known in any country, is wonderfully rich, and needs only a railroad to come up through it to drive out this outlaw class and develop as rich a line of coal and iron properties as can be found anywhere. The timber in this region is very heavy, and especially valuable. But land speculators and railroad capitalists have, up to the present time, fought rather shy of this region. A week or two before I set out, I had a talk with one of the officers of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad, and he told me that he would not go up through this Logan County country for a majority of the stock of his road. I understand that prospectors have, in any number of instances, met with very severe punishment for their temerity, in venturing into this country without being properly vouched for. Along the line of Peter's Creek, during the past two months, there have been a number of murders of strangers which have not attracted the slightest attention. The people in that neighborhood, when they hear any shooting, simply go inside their houses and shut their doors. They have no curiosity whatever to know what is going on when the crack of the Winchester rifle is heard. The Phillips crowd, who now control the Peters Creek region, are even more desperate than the Hatfields. I do not think the Hatfields would shoot down strangers on general suspicion unless the stranger made some direct move against them. But over in the Peters Creek region, the fact that a man is a stranger is quite enough to invite shots from the numerous ambuscades which are occupied along the line of this most wretched locality. End of section 14. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 15 of An American Vendetta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Philip Aldred, Nottingham, UK. An American Vendetta, a story of barbarism in the United States, by T. C. Crawford. Chapter 11, The Commercial Traveller's Story, Part 1. Seated in front of the fire, in a lonely farmhouse in the bottoms of the Guyandot River, on the road to Logan Courthouse, I listened to a story of adventure told by a commercial traveller. It illustrates so well some of the phases of life in this land of barbarism 
that I have endeavoured to reproduce it simply as it was told to me, and to present it as the closing chapter of my experiences in Murderland. The commercial traveller was originally from Vienna. He had served in the Austrian army, losing all his property necessary to his support by foolish and wasteful living. He was obliged to resign. He came to this country to seek employment. He had drifted into the employment of a Richmond house, and at the time I saw him, had been travelling through the rough parts of Virginia and West Virginia for some five years. Twice a year he came over the mountain roads to Logan Courthouse. He travelled with a light wagon and a stout pair of grey horses, and as he was an accomplished whip, managed to get over the roads in very good time, although each time he went through this particular country, he was invariably made ill by the food and the rough riding. Lifting his soft black hat from his blond curls, as he stared through the cloud of smoke, straight into the blazing coal fire, this ex-cavalry officer of the Austrian army, and former pet of Vienna society, began as follows. I have been coming into this country now for over five years, but until last year I never met with any experience that was in any way out of the ordinary. It was a dull round of coarse food, bad beds, hard riding, without any pleasure to be found anywhere in the society of the mountain people, who are as dull as death when sober, and who when drunk are simply quarrelsome and murderous. Coming out of this country last fall, I was congratulating myself upon the fact that my two weeks' penance was nearly at an end. I was within half a day's ride of a railroad station, from where I could reach civilization in a few hours. I was nearly ill from fatigue and the bad food. Still I kept up well enough, knowing I was so nearly through with my work. In coming around a rocky bend in the road, overhanging the precipitous banks of the Coal River, I met in the narrowest part of the road a wagon, a most unusual sight where nearly all the travel is on horseback. The wagon was drawn by two stout bay horses. The driver was a negro coachman in a shabby livery. Upon the second seat in the wagon, which was covered, was a lady. I had barely time to notice her at first, as I had my hands full in making room for them to pass. I backed my wagon until its hind wheels actually hung balanced over the overhanging rock looking down on the river. I had confidence in my horses, however. They stood firm, where a single backward movement of nervousness would have sent me down onto the rocks below with a broken neck. I just noted that the lady stared at me with terror in her intensely black eyes as her driver slid his wagon clumsily by, barely shoving me as I sat balancing whip in hand, ready to start my horses at the first sign of a clear passage. It was but a moment of suspense. It was ticklish for the minute, but you get used to every kind of risk to life and limb on these mountain roads. As I swung back into the road and to safety again, the lady turned and said, I am so glad you escaped without accident. I hope you will pardon us for being the occasion of so much risk. I took off my hat involuntarily and bowed very low. I was overwhelmed with surprise. It was the voice of a lady, and what was more, of a cultivated lady. It was the first time I had ever heard such a voice in this wretched country. It was the first time I had ever seen a lady in this region. What could she be doing here, 
in a country where the hardships were so great as to try the fortitude of the strongest of men. In the quick glance of respectful curiosity, I saw that she was young, dark, with very regular features, with blue-black hair showing in a luxuriant coil from under a high black felt hat, ornamented with a raven's wing. Her dress was a close-fitting black. By her side was a huge portmanteau, covered with the labels of European travel. With the driver, and in the front part of the wagon, were several bags and boxes. As I gazed, the lady bowed, and the wagon disappeared round the corner. For several moments I sat lost in thought. What was the meaning of this strange invasion of this land of barbarism? Surely no liveried servant had ever been seen here before. And where and when in the annals of this brutal land had a lady, one of the flowers of modern civilization, ever before appeared? Do not think me over-sentimental for a commercial traveller. Remember my former position and training, if you wish to account for my musing. Then, when you add to this the well-known natural susceptibility of the commercial traveller to the charms of the fair sex, and you will have something by way of explanation for my being completely transfixed and overwhelmed by the sight which had so quickly disappeared. I could not but help thinking of what this lady had before her, guarded only by a stupid-looking servant. Surely she could never have ventured into this country if she could have had an idea of its difficulties, its hardships, and the absolute disregard for the refinements of life, no more allowance being made for the presence of women than if they were so many inferior animals. As I thought through this most interesting of subjects, I involuntarily backed my horses again, and by exercising great ingenuity succeeded in turning them back upon the road over which I had just made such a wearisome journey. At first I tried to cheat myself with the idea that I had neglected to visit one of the smaller towns upon the crossing of this bad road and that I ought to return for this purpose. But soon I renounced even this delusion. I found myself under the impulse of a strange spell. I felt impelled to ride on until I should learn more of this strange lady, of the terrible necessity which had brought her into this desolate waste and, if need be, come to her aid against the dangers and discomforts surrounding every stranger's visit to this region. I could not now explain to you the feeling that controlled me. I seemed to be acting under orders mysteriously spoken by some unknown but superior power. I followed along slowly, keeping the strange carriage barely in sight when, in turning the bend just above the very difficult fording of a jagged, rock-bottomed stream, I saw signs of distress ahead. The strange lady's carriage had broken down. The place of the accident was the usual one for such accidents to occur in this region. It was at a place four miles distant from the nearest house. Dense forests lined both sides of the terrific stretch of rocky road, dug here and there into awful pits of mud and water, and crossed at frequent intervals by trunks of decaying and half-buried trees. The constant wrenching and jolting had proven too much for the wheels of the lady's carriage. The two on the right side had been completely dished, that is, turned in until the spokes were half broken from their setting in the hub. As I came up, the lady who had alighted turned to me with an eager look of relief, as her aged coloured servant stood looking at the wreck without being able to suggest the slightest way of righting the mishap. 
the lady's look of relief was mingled with one of surprise at seeing me after having passed me only a short time ago going in an opposite direction standing on the ground i saw she was slightly above medium height her figure was straight and lithe the lines of which indicated energy and youthful vitality she had a quick nervous way of moving about indicating a fierce impatience to my offer of assistance she responded with grateful frankness and without the slightest reserve i had in my mountain rides been confronted with such accidents before i had a wrench a hammer and a hatchet in my wagon for use upon such occasions i directed the helpless negro to bring a rail from a neighboring fence and in a few moments i had the carriage propped up and the wheels off with another rail employed as a lever the negro and i managed by our combined weight to bring the spokes back into their place then i cut some tough hickory withes and weaving them in and out between the broken spokes i managed to so strengthen the broken wheels that they could be trusted with careful management to serve their purpose for several hours at least when this was done i turned to the lady and said permit me to offer you a seat in my carriage to your next stopping place as your carriage should now travel with as light a load as possible to avoid a second breakdown there's a blacksmith's shop ten miles further on this road near a house where i have often stopped it is the only comfortable place within twenty miles and it is now coming on night rapidly i hope you will accept my offer without ceremony as i have been obliged to retrace my road on account of an important matter which i had by strange mischance forgotten the lady said i accept your kind offer gratefully i do not know what i should have done if you had not been turned back by providence to come to our rescue with this she turned to me with a bow and i assisted her to a seat at my side in my carriage i now drove on in advance telling the coloured man to follow us carefully there was fully two hours drive ahead of us and the sun was beginning to disappear grey mists were beginning to float on the many streams crossing this wild road while down from the mountain swept an icy air that penetrated like a knife my companion as she talked betrayed a slight foreign accent she told me her name it was mrs von bergen wife or widow i did not venture to ask although my bachelor heart yearned to know mrs von bergen's name indicated foreign associations and her slight accent indicated foreign birth although she spoke english with great fluency and correctness she did not by word or sign explain her mission into this country she accepted my companionship with the frankness of good fellowship she talked easily and freely of current affairs for a young woman and she could not have been a day over twenty-five she evidently had seen a great deal of the world her manner recalled to me the best manners of the great ladies i used to know in vienna society jaded and worn out as i had been by the fatigues of the last two weeks i forgot them all in the charm of the society of this independent self-possessed lady i can hardly recall now anything she said it was not much at the time as she too was clearly very much fatigued with her first day's journey in the mountains her voice was rich and full it was keyed low it suggested the possession of a contralto voice of fine quality mrs von bergen's manner indicated rare courage and decision of character end of section 15 chapter 11 part 1
Section 16 of An American Vendetta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vicki VM. An American Vendetta. A Story of Barbarism in the United States by T.C. Crawford. Chapter 11, Part 2. As we drove along over the wild roads, the darkness came upon us very rapidly. Before we had gone half the distance, the light had disappeared so that I had to trust my horses almost entirely for the road. I drove slowly so as to keep the negro coachman behind me as near as possible. Soon I discovered my companion was shivering with the cold. Then I resolved to seek shelter at a nearer place. I remembered a farmhouse where I had formerly found fairly decent accommodations. I said, This chill that is in the night air is full of malaria. I am sure you will become ill if you do not find rest and shelter now very soon. If you will permit, we will try at the next farmhouse. Mrs. Von Bergen eagerly assented. A few moments after, we came down a very sharp rise and saw the lights of the farmhouse where I had before been received. We stopped in front of the house. This was the signal for the appearance of a dozen wild dogs, which barked with the ferocity and uproar of a pack of wolves. Following the country custom, I sat in my carriage and cried out above the din, Halloo! For several moments the house showed no signs of life, although I called out at frequent intervals. After a wait of five minutes, which seemed very long indeed, a reluctant figure of a man, dressed in the butternut garb of the mountaineer farmers, appeared at the door. He stood in the broad glare of the light of an open fireplace, while we sat shivering in the misty, damp darkness and debated with himself whether he would take us in or not. Finally, hospitality or the thought of an extra dollar prevailed, and we were passed through the vigilant guard of dogs to the fire, where Mrs. Von Bergen shivered and shook for fully half an hour before she recovered from her chill. It was a strange picture to see this refined, striking-looking lady sitting buried in anxious thought over this blazing fire in this great room, about which beds were ranged in true mountain fashion. These beds were filled with children, with the exception of one large bed, which had just been vacated by our unwilling host and hostess. After a short time, the farmer's wife gave us a supper. Mrs. Von Bergen ate but little. After the supper, I explained to the mountaineer the necessity of Mrs. Von Bergen's having a place to sleep separate from his family. They managed with difficulty to give her a bed in a little lumber room out of their one family room while I spent the night in the chair in front of the fire. In the morning, after a meager breakfast and our horses were hooked up to the carriages, I ventured to ask some questions of my companion. I said to her, In one hour we shall arrive at the little settlement where you can have your carriage mended. Now I do not wish to be inquisitive. But you do not appear to understand what an impossible country you are in, and what dangers and discomforts are in the way of your father venturing into it. It grows wilder and more desolate as you advance. You will not find a single comfort or resource of modern civilization. If you become ill, you can have no physician. And if you die, no word of your death will ever reach your friends, as the people here are ignorant and indifferent. I know this country well. I have a few days at my disposal, as a vacation is due me from my employers. If you care to confide your mission to me, I may be of assistance to you. Permit me to place my services at your disposal. I will do my best to aid you in your mission in a country where certainly no lady ever before ventured to come. Mrs. Von Bergen looked at me long and earnestly, and then her eyes filled with tears as she grasped me by the hand. I have met with much kindness in this country, said she, but with nothing equal to this. I shall accept your offer in the spirit it is made, for I am beginning to see that I have undertaken more than I can carry out unaided. Listen, she continued, with rapid, energetic gestures. 
I can give you but a half confidence. The real object of my mission must remain a secret, but a very important part of it I shall be glad to tell you about, as it is absolutely necessary for me to have the assistance of someone who knows this country thoroughly. Do you know a place called Logan Courthouse? Yes, I do. What kind of place is it? It is a small village of two or three hundred inhabitants, dependent upon the mountain farmers of the surrounding neighborhood. It is a good day's ride in advance of us. It is the center of the most lawless outlaw population in the United States. It is so remote from outside civilization that there is no pretense there of enforcing the law. Crime is never punished except by personal vengeance. It is the headquarters, today, of a powerful family engaged in one of the bloodiest vendettas known in this country. Think well before venturing into such a place. I feel confident that I could protect you against any actual violence, but I could not prevent the possibility of your being made a witness to scenes that would certainly shock and terrify you. For I warn you that you are now going straight into the devil's own particular country, where for nearly 100 years the church and all her agents have renounced all struggle with him and have left on the big sandy only one feeble structure to indicate that they ever cared to undertake a struggle with such a formidable adversary. Mrs. Von Bergen straightened with really an almost military erectness as she said, Still, I must go. But that is not all. What further obstacles shall I meet? Are you prepared to go without food for days, except the coarse, greasy stuff that nothing but actual starvation will enable you to force down? Can you go through a country where you can find no house where you can be assured of any privacy? where a woman in the mind of everyone in the neighborhood ranks no higher than an Indian squaw? I must go, nevertheless, at all risk. I shall say no more, and shall give you all the assistance in my power. Thank you very much. I am in such desperate need of help that I shall accept without remorse what I know I have no right to ask or expect. But I owe you some sort of explanation in return for your kindness. Here my fair companion turned towards me and said, Did you ever hear of General Steinmetz of the Austrian army? I had the honor of once serving under him. You? Yes, madam. I was formerly an officer in the Austrian army. How strange to meet a fellow countryman in this wild country, and a former officer under my father. "'for you must know I am a daughter of General Steinmetz.' "'At this I took off my hat and saluted the daughter "'of my most distinguished chief of former days. "'The pleasure and charm of her presence "'was doubly increased by this knowledge "'of her being a fellow countrywoman "'and the daughter of my former chief. "'I have always been a wild enthusiast, "'owing doubtless to the strain of Magyar in my blood.' I was ready to go ahead with my companion and to serve her without question, and to serve her as loyally and devotedly as any knight of olden time. Pardon my sentimental attitude. Even commercial travelers may have occasional periods in their lives where they can rise to emotions above the pleasure of mere taking orders and selling goods. I did not attempt to analyze my feeling. I was so pleased to get out of the routine rut of my humdrum existence in this most humdrum of countries that I was content beyond expression. Mrs. Von Bergen, after listening to my enthusiastic pledges on learning that she too was from my own city of Vienna, continued, My father, you well know, was in this country during the late War of Rebellion. He was on the staff of General Grant. He was in this country at the close of the war. He passed through this very region afterwards with General Sheridan. In company with the general, he bought a large tract of land in the neighborhood of Logan Courthouse upon the favorable opinion of one of the engineer members of General Sheridan's staff. 
This engineer said that this land contained a magnificent coal property and that it would be possible to develop it as soon as a railroad should pass through this country. My father bought the land, 5,000 acres, for a very small sum. Soon after its purchase, he was suddenly recalled from his special service in the United States to Vienna. There he was occupied for many years with special work. He used to think occasionally of this land, but as the projected railroad was never built, he never was able to realize on his property. Last year he died, leaving me heiress to his property. I was his youngest and only surviving child. I was born in the year following his return to Vienna. He kept up the taxes on this land through an agent in Charleston until about five years ago. I have very important reasons for finding out about this land as soon as possible. I have learned in New York that a railroad is to be built through here at once. My father lost the original deeds. At least these were not among his papers. I have with me the proof of my identity and a copy of my father's will, certified to by the Vienna Minister of Foreign Affairs and approved by the Austrian Council General at New York. I do not even know where this land is, except that it is in the vicinity of Logan Courthouse. The agent at Charleston who looked after this property has moved away, and I was unable to find out from anyone where he had gone. It is necessary for me to find this property and to sell it as quickly as possible. I must also be back in New York by the 18th of this month. It is now the 10th. I know that. It will take one day more to go to Logan Courthouse, two days to return, one day and night to reach New York. That will give you just four days for the search for your property. It must be done in that time. My success and my being in New York upon the 18th of this month involves a matter much more serious than life or death. As this was said, we arrived at Racine, a dingy little crossroads post office place hanging on to the scraggly banks of a malarious little mud creek crawling sluggishly along under the banks of rolling and deeply wooded hills. At Racine, it was soon found that it would take several hours to mend the broken wagon. The postmistress of the place, who also managed the little house, which was an apology for a tavern, loaned us a stout wagon sufficiently good for the servant and the baggage. This was arranged in a few moments, and then we pressed rapidly on. I do not propose to describe the monotony of the West Virginia hills, which never rise at any point along the line of this road to the dignity of mountains. The rough riding prevented much conversation. In one or two places, we found the stream swollen so that we were delayed. The darkness of the late fall day swept down upon us before we had reached the end of the journey. Again, I had to apply to the private hospitality of the country. I remembered one place of a most desirable character. It was the comfortable house of a former captain in the Confederate service. He is a man of very peculiar ideas. He is a very upright man and noted throughout the neighborhood for his bravery and his integrity. Still, his house was not a general stopping place, and it depended very much upon his mood whether he was willing to take in strangers or not. To my call of hello, he responded by coming to the door, followed by the usual pack of dogs and children. He was a tall, broad-shouldered man with a resolute hook nose, face set off by a white military mustache. He had the air and pose of a great landlord instead of being a well-to-do farmer in a small way. He came out to apologize to me for not taking me in as a guest, but when he saw my lady companion and listened to a word of explanation concerning her, he at once relented and invited us into the great room of his snugly built house where he gave us seats in front of the ever-open blazing fireside of these mountain houses. End of section 16. Recording by Vicki V.M. Section 17 of An American Vendetta.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vicki VM. An American Vendetta A Story of Barbarism in the United States by T.C. Crawford. Chapter 11, Part 3. I will pass over the details of the struggle to wash in the iron skillet outside the door and the attempt to eat something from the table bountifully supplied with fried pork, heavy bread, and corn pone, and return to the scene which took place in front of the fire an hour after the meal. Captain John, as he was called in the community, was a most gallant man. There were three topics dear to his heart and I named them in the order of their nearness and their dearness. First, military achievements and anecdotes of the war. Second, fair and lovely women. And third, horses, as he called them. He was enchanted with the honor of having such a guest seated in his house as this fair Vienna lady, when he learned that she was the daughter of a soldier and of a great general, his enthusiasm knew no bounds. The captain regarded himself as one of the military geniuses of this age. During the war, he was the captain of a company called the Logan County Tigers. In his opinion, he maneuvered this company during the war with more actual skill and talent than was displayed by any officer in the army. None of my men, said he, were ever killed when I was in command. I never was a doggone fool enough to have my men stand up when there was any fighting going on. I kept them close to the ground where every now and then one of them would get touched, but none of them ever got killed. It was he who once gave General Lee free and frank advice how to conduct his campaign was sent to the guardhouse for two weeks to ruminate over the jealousy of great commanders who were incapable of receiving wisdom from subordinates. It was during the recital of some of these reminiscences he chanced to mention the name of General Steinmetz as one of those foreign officer chaps who came down through these mountains after the war was over. He had not noted the name of Mrs. von Bergen's father when she was first introduced to him. It was an off chance that called up the reminiscence of this officer in the eccentric captain's mind. Mrs. von Bergen started at the mention of her father's name and said, And did you know him? Yes, said the captain. He was a pretty decent sort of a man for a Dutchman, and I remember as acting as his guide going with him with a lot of these Yankee fellows who were hunting up coal land. The little Dutch general bought a right smart lot of land, but Lord bless me, he never came back, and the last time I heard anything about it, Sam Hatfield had jumped his land and was living on it. I started at this, for I knew Sam Hatfield to be one of the most desperate of a noted band of mountain outlaws. They were men who decided all disputes with shotguns and whose most pointed arguments were made with bowie knives. I explained in a few words to the captain the situation, that this lady was the daughter of General Steinmetz and that she had come into this country to reclaim her father's land. All of the gallantry and the courage of the former captain of the Logan County Wildcats came to the surface at once. I am an old man, said he, and have kept out of these quarrels for a good many years. I have tried to steer clear of these year outlaws and let them settle all their quarrels among themselves. I came to the conclusion some years ago that the more they killed of each other, the better it was for the country, and so long as peaceable, law-abiding people could steer clear of them, why these killers should be allowed to go their own way. But I never yet have seen the time when I would desert the cause of any lady, and particularly when military genius is required for her protection and the securing of her rights. For you must know that Sam Hatfield is one of the most powerful of his crowd. He has killed at least a dozen men in his time. There is a big price now on his head. 
He goes about constantly armed. He has in his neighborhood and in his constant society half a dozen fellers as desperate and as wicked as he. He has taken this property, and any attempt to put him out will be followed by a fight. Now, if you will let me plan this campaign against this year Hatfield, I think I will bring you through all right, although I have no company of Logan County Tigers at my back. The old man was grand in his air of benevolence and protection. As he stretched to its full height, his powerful figure bade us good night so as to prepare for an early start. Mrs. Von Bergen was given a bed in the loft of this great room. In company with the children and two old women, distant relatives of this bachelor captain, who lived with him to look after his place. I was given a bed in a kind of granary at one end of the house, where ghostly white flower bags and sacks of grain stared at me like ghosts until I fell asleep, worn out by fatigue. The next morning, the captain brought around a large bottle of white Mountain Dew whiskey in a huge tin cup and offered his guest half a pint as an eye-opener. He could not understand my refusal, not comprehending how any human being could begin to grind out a daily existence without a preliminary of half a pint to a pint of nearly raw alcohol. After breakfast, about which the least said the better, the captain mounted a stout brown horse and followed us for an hour's drive, which was necessary to bring us into the straggling hamlet of Logan Courthouse. Much to my regret, I found that it was court week in this straggling little town made up of low-roof wooden houses, the majority of which were unpainted. The street swarmed with mountaineers who had come down from the most distant neighborhoods for the excitement of meeting their neighbors and getting drunk with them during the meeting. There was also a general air of expectancy running through all the groups we saw in the streets. No court week had ever passed without its dozens of fights. The landlord of the little house where we stopped told me that the day before, 300 shots had been fired on the streets during a political discussion without any protest from the sheriff. This latter individual, the representative of law and order, had stood about with his hands in his pockets, laughing like a hyena. He said at the close of the shooting, he never had so much fun in his life. He never even remotely suggested the arresting of anybody, as that would have been regarded as interference with the freedom of the American citizens of this neighborhood, which would have been bitterly resented by everyone. I found that I could not obtain a private room for my companion at the hotel. The only room possible for her to have there was one which she would have been obliged to share with two mountain women who had come to Logan Courthouse hunting for their two husbands who had run away during previous court meeting and had not been heard of since. Fortunately, I found upon the porch of this beggarly little house a good-natured, rotund, Irish land speculator friend of mine from Virginia. His name was Dr. Palmer. He was a strong, swarthy-faced man, dressed in rough brown clothes, who took life exactly as he found it. It was his business there to buy the best land he could find for a great eastern syndicate. It was a matter of utmost indifference to him, whatever the inhabitants were pleased to do. They might rob, shoot, and kill as many as they pleased. His infernal Irish good nature never changed for one moment. He called everybody from the outlaws up good fellows and continued to buy his land right and left and never expressed any opinion concerning local institutions. In this way, he became very successful. I said to him, You are the very man I want to see. As I explained to him the object of my mission, he listened very keenly when he heard that there was a prospect of buying good land. But when I told him where Captain John said the land was, he shook his head. He said, I like to buy land, but I don't like to buy rows. I don't say what my individual taste would be. 
There is no Irishman living who would ever run away from a fight, but I am buying land here for a lot of cold-blooded Yankee speculators who have no sentiment in them. They want something more substantial in return for their money than the glorious excitement of a ready-made fight. Now the man who buys that property you describe, and I confess it is a very good piece of land with handsome coal indication, will purchase the liveliest fight that ever was bargained for in this land of scrimmages, jamborees, and endless shindies. In the first place, it is now held down by right of squatter sovereignty by one of the most desperate villains that a great and good God ever allowed to escape the halter. He is worse than any rattlesnake you ever saw. There is a band of vipers living with him. After you have scotched them, your fun is only begun. Every one of those wretches has a perfect swarm of relatives. Every one of these relatives has a Winchester rifle, four revolvers, two knives, and a bottle of whiskey. Upon the announcement of the death of any one of these vipers by violence, each and every one of the relatives will proceed to fulfill the solemn conditions of his clan by swallowing the bottle of whiskey and then starting out with his entire arsenal of arms to slay and destroy those who have laid hands upon his relatives. In the same way, if you can drive these wretches out without hurting them, they will come back with this crowd in the same way and shoot anyone who tries to hold the land against them. You have been in this country long enough now to know that the rule of the man of might is the only law recognized here. I buy only land about which there can be no dispute. And as I treat these fellows all well, and as I give them no idea that I am buying for Yankees, there is never any dispute about what I do. Captain John, who had come up during this conversation, had listened to the latter part of it with great attention. He never looked more like a soldier than he did at the close of the doctor's remarks. He stood very straight, with his slouch hat cocked in the most belligerent fashion over his right ear, and his flowing white mustache standing out in savage curls on either side of his hard-lined mouth. He looked at me for a moment with a very resolute air, then he dropped his left eye with a sly air and said, Now is the time for military strategy, and immediately disappeared down the street without a word of explanation. Thanks to the kindness of Dr. Palmer, an invitation was secured for Mrs. Von Bergen as a guest at the house of the leading merchant of the place. His house boasted of the oriental magnificence of a spare bedroom, and in this chamber Mrs. Von Bergen sat down to confer with the only lawyer of the place about the title deeds to her property. This lawyer, who belonged to a much better family than is ordinarily found in the mountains, received an education in Charleston. He was vastly superior to his surroundings, but a fatal lack of energy and a fondness for the whiskey of his native land kept him a humble resident at Logan Courthouse, when his abilities would have justified his becoming an important man in the state. With him, Mrs. Von Bergen visited the courthouse and soon found the record of the deed acquired by her father some twenty-odd years before. She was able to comply with the few formalities that were required. She then paid the small amount of taxes due for the last five years and received, during the course of the day, a new copy of the deed and full receipts for taxes. She was now in a position to sell. During court week, there were always land speculators in town. This court week proved no exception to the rule. There were at least six reputable purchasers at Logan Courthouse at the time of our visit. During the day, Dr. Palmer called upon her in company with the lawyer and represented to her the difficulty she would have in obtaining possession of the land. End of section 17. Recording by Vicki VM. Section 18 of An American Vendetta. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham McMillan, San Diego, California. An American Vendetta, a story of barbarism in the United States, by T.C. Crawford. Chapter 11, Part 4. It was then Mrs. Von Bergen made an heroic resolution, which was fully in keeping with her character. She proposed to visit the land herself, and to make an appeal to the squatters personally, to see if she could not persuade them to leave peaceably. No arguments of the doctors could change her decision. The philosophical Irish speculator became very much excited as he talked with her. Do you know, my dear madam, he said he, that these people are not human beings. They have no sentiments to which you could make any appeal. They are simply animals of the lowest degree. They would as soon kill a woman as a man. The only answer that you will have to your appeal will be a bullet, if these squatters think that you are in earnest in your attempt to dispossess them of this land. When this argument failed to make any impression on this courageous woman, the doctor said, You will not be able to drive there. The roads leading to it are impassable for wagons. It can only be reached after two hours of the hardest kind of horseback riding. The reply to this was that she was used to horseback riding, that she would prefer that means of going. Mrs. von Bergen said to me, Of course I cannot ask you to go and assume any risk. I replied, with the phrase of the northern patriots during the war, that I had enlisted for the war and did not propose to desert then. She thanked me with a smile and asked me to make preparation for an early morning start, as she proposed to use the remainder of the first day of the four she had, before she must turn back, in resting from the fatigues of her journey. The little Irish land speculator came out with me. He said, with many an emphatic oath, I am going to break over the rule of my life for this region, and possibly destroy my business here forever. Up to the present time I have kept out of all these rows. It is a matter of indifference to me how many of the animals in this neighborhood kill each other. But when I see a real lady involved, overboard goes all my prudence. I will stand by you, my boy, throughout the whole affair. And if a hair of that lady's head is harmed by any of these outlaws, I will start in to shoot and kill, myself, until I make a record equal to any man's in the county. I thanked the enthusiastic doctor for his support. I then went back to the hotel and engaged horses for the next day. This was accomplished with great difficulty. It was not possible to secure any guide. There was no man in the town who could be hired for love or money to direct a party of strangers in the direction of Sam Hatfield's house. The little doctor heard of my inquiries and came to me, saying, I know this country like a book. You will need no guide with me along. Then there is not the slightest prospect of your changing your mind? Not the slightest. When was there ever an Irishman who could resist the luxury of doing a foolishly reckless thing, which at the same time endangered life and everything he has in the world, to go through with a fight? Captain John continued to act in a very mysterious manner. He did not appear at the hotel until half-past eight that evening. When he came in he was beaming with satisfaction. Military strategy was his sole subject of conversation. He kept very close to reminiscences of the war, however, and of the great things he had done in the past. He seemed to have quite forgotten all about Mrs. von Bergen. He did not make the slightest allusion to her or her visit. I left him smoking over the fire, talking with two or three of his associates. I did not tell him until just before I retired of our intention to make an early start in the morning. I asked him this to see if he would be willing to go along with us. My information seemed to greatly excite him. He said, Oh, you may be sure I will go. You should have told me this before. Then, with an air of military severity, I want you to remember that I am the military commander of this expedition, and its success depends upon absolute obedience to my orders, and upon your doing nothing without consulting me. I don't think much of this expedition going out in the morning, but if you will follow my advice, you will delay the start until noon, and then go the road that I will take you, and we will have that place cleared free and well, you may be sure. I thought it well to humor the captain. I knew that he was a great authority in that country, possessed a careful knowledge of the people and their ways, and I had some faint belief in his capacity for military strategy. At any rate, I thought enough of the captain's suggestion to delay the start until noon. This was made easy by a pretext that horses could not be obtained before that time. We set out at precisely twelve o'clock from Bunce's hotel, where the horses had been brought up. They were the sorriest-looking animals possible, but they were used to the mountain roads, and were good enough to take us for the short journey we had in view. We set out with the captain leading. He was the only well-mounted man in the line. He had the strong brown horse from his own farm. We all followed in single file. The Irish doctor was next to the captain. After him came Mrs. von Bergen, and after her, myself. The servant we left behind. 
not one of us was armed it has been my rule in travelling in this country not to carry arms i have found that the carrying of arms is more likely to get you into trouble than out of it the road taken by the captain was even worse than the one over which we had come to the logan courthouse it was impassable for wagons of any kind it would suddenly pitch down steep declivities into roaring streams and then wind along over sharp rocks and under overhanging branches of dense masses of trees the course was a natural one made by the mountain streams we simply followed them winding in and out over the banks and crossing them from one side to the other as we were turned to the right or left by the numerous obstacles encountered i had been told at logan courthouse that this land was distant only two hours ride even over this rough road the captain must have taken us by some roundabout course for we rode until six o'clock before he ordered a halt he stopped in front of a small log hut lying under the shadow of a dense forest which swept down from the purple hills of a far distant background this house was deserted the captain walked in with the air of the proprietor an open fire was blazing in the hearth the captain turned to mrs von bergen and said with a genial air of hospitality this little place i have borrowed for this expedition it belongs to an old friend of mine he has only one room to be sure but you will find it very comfortable on that pile of skins in the corner and as we men folks will be on guard tonight why you can sleep there just as safe as a baby he then took me aside and from the front of the house pointed out a log house with a shingle roof about a quarter of a mile away that said he is sam hatfield's house that is where he's squat he's got ten men with him for he has received a warning that some of the mccoys were after him and he has laid in a stock of ammunition and is waiting for the boys who have been threatening to cross the river most any night and wipe him out they owe him one on account of his killing about three weeks ago dave mccoy when he was out fishing in tug river they dropped the boy as usual from behind but some of the country people saw who did it and so the word was passed around although no one ever dreamed of going nigh any of the court officers in the case now this year lady in here will have no more chance of mercy if she should attempt to go over to that house than if she should go into a rattlesnake's nest i am hopin if my plans carry that she'll have no need to bother with those sorts of animals tomorrow morning what do you mean i asked what is the plan the captain turned to me and said now it is too late for anybody to stop it i don't mind telling you i have been playing a bit of military strategy you know i have made it a rule never to mix in these quarrels yesterday i sent word to the mccoys that sam hatfield was intending to leave the country and that he would probably get away tonight they will probably be across the river within the next two hours i told them to come strong and there will be thirty or forty of them they will come prepared to kill sam hatfield and to burn up the house and then you see that property will be clear and free without getting any respectable people involved in this fight do you mean to say said i that you have deliberately planned to have these people begin killing each other simply for the purpose of freeing this property why you are really worse than they the captain looked at me with pity it's easy to see said he that you have never been a soldier or you wouldn't talk like that these people are all the time shooting at each other the mccoys were coming over some night this week anyway we have no law and no punishment in this country for shooting and where's the harm in my setting these wild cats at each other a night or two in advance of what they originally intended seems to me you got foreign notions in your head i don't believe you were even a naturalized american citizen if you were you would have more sense i shall not attempt to make any apology for myself i did not say one word to mrs von bergen about the situation i must confess that i even took actual pleasure in the thought that the mccoys were going to cross the river that night to aid in evicting the murderous hatfield who held the property of my friend perhaps i had been in this barbarous country so long that i had become infected with its spirit however that may be i present the case as it is without any attempt to soften any one's judgment of my conduct soon after my arrival we had a meagre repast from a lunch brought with us at nine o'clock mrs von bergen wrapped herself in a huge rug and lying down upon a pile of skins in the corner soon fell asleep overcome by the fatigue of the afternoon ride the captain waited outside the house steadily watching the hatfield house i remained with him determined to remain up all night to watch the outcome the doctor wrapped himself in a great cloak and went to sleep under the shelter of the porch it was a lonesome watch the night was cold and the gray mist from the creeks was very dense and penetrating about half past eleven footsteps were heard in the road the captain signaled for me to be silent there then passed around the corner in front of our house some thirty men they were all on horseback we awakened the doctor and told him in a word what was up 
the captain said you remain here so in case the lady wakes up you will be able to keep her from becoming too scared my friend and i will just follow this crowd up the road to see what they are going to do end of section eighteen recording by graham mcmillan san diego california section nineteen of an american vendetta this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Philip Aldred in Nottingham, UK. An American Vendetta A Story of Barbarism in the United States by T. C. Crawford. Chapter 11, Part 5. The horsemen by this time disappeared. We followed cautiously after them. They dismounted when they were within thirty rods of the Hatfield house and tied their horses in the neighbouring woods. There one or two men were left on guard. An order or two was given and the men separated in the darkness. It was evident that they were given orders to surround the house. Sam Hatfield evidently was not to be taken absolutely by surprise, for the surrounding party had not taken over a dozen steps when the crack of a Winchester was heard in the neighbourhood of the house, the singing of a bullet, and then the sound of flying feet and slamming of a door. The outside sentry had fired a signal of alarm and had taken refuge in the house. The firing instantly became general. The attacking party fired round after round at the house. This continued for upwards of half an hour. Shots from the house were returned. Then there was silence. Evidently the invading party had devised some new plan of attack. What this was was soon made apparent. While attracting the attention of the besiegers by a pretended attack, at the front of the house, one or two of the McCoys ran up from the rear and set fire to the building. There were no women in Sam Hatfield's family at that time. His wife had deserted him some three months before because of his cruel treatment. The moment the house was fired, the light shingles caught like tow. The hole was in a flame in a moment lighting up with a vivid glare the clear and open glade in which the house was situated. The Hatfields saw in a moment that their only chance was in a charge to break through the line. While two or three kept up a rattling fire from the front, the door to the back part of the house was opened, and in a moment ten men came rushing out running swiftly as possible to the woods thirty rods away. Instantly the fire of the attacking party was concentrated upon the Hadfields. One or two of the inmates of the house fell. Just as the party reached the woods, a third Hatfield was winged and dropped to the ground. The firing ceased when the survivors of the party reached the woods. We were not near enough to hear what was said. The leader of the attacking party had the three bodies brought together and laid in a row. We were not near enough to recognise any of the fallen, and the captain would not listen for a moment to my proposition to walk up and inquire. He said, Those gentlemen are engaged in a very serious business, and no matter who comes up now, he will simply be regarded as a spy, and the safest thing for us to do is to get back to that house and get off of this year road. We made our way back as quietly as possible, and there we found Mrs. von Bergen awake, standing outside, near the door, in company with the doctor. 
She was greatly excited over the terrible picture of the night attack and the burning of the house. We explained to her what had occurred without suggesting the captain's share in the performance. The doctor said with a very grim smile, Mrs. von Bergen, your mission here seems to be very successful. The squatters on our property seem to be swept away, and if I could have any assurance of the Hatfields' leaders that none of them would ever come back to that property, I would buy it of you. The doctor added, The Hatfields will shoot and kill, but they won't steal or lie. Squatting on other people's land they regard as a natural right, but I never knew a Hatfield to break his word. If one of them should say he was going to kill me, I should go out and select my place in the family lot to get ready. They have a strange way of keeping their word under all circumstances. None of us thought of sleep after this horrible affair, which from the beginning to the close had occupied fully two hours. If I had more imagination, I suppose that I would be able to give you a very dramatic picture of this scene. But I can only tell it in my plain way, and leave it to you to supply what is necessary for the picture from your own imagination. About two o'clock, startled by hearing the tramp of a horse's feet outside and then a call of, Hello! The captain went to the door and answered back, Hello! Some words were passed between him and the outside caller. He disappeared for some moments in the darkness. Then he came back hastily and said, Do you know who's outside? It's Sam Hatfield. Two of his friends have got him here on a horse. He'd been very hard hit, but the boys got him away, and just now they are looking for shelter. He's bled a heap, and they think unless they can get him in near a fire right away and get some liquor down his throat, he will die. I ran in here just to warn you, for they're coming in here slow. A moment after... The door opened again, and there entered two brawny mountaineers with Winchesters on their backs, one man supporting the head and shoulders, the other carrying the feet of the wounded man. He was placed in front of the fire and propped up by a rug. I have a good deal of experience in the army, and I examined the wounded man with a great deal of interest. He'd been shot in the side, he'd bled profusely, and it was evident from his condition that he was also bleeding inwardly. The chill which he felt outside was the coming rigor of death. I suppose a dramatic writer would find much material for a picture in the scene which was presented around this dying man. Here at his right, kneeling with the devotion and attention of a sister of charity, was one of the most refined and accomplished women of Vienna society. The Irish doctor was on the other side, feeding the wounded man teaspoonfuls of whisky through his blue lips and set teeth. I kept my hand on the wounded man's pulse. Two mountaineers stood back with their hats doffed. From the expression upon their faces, I realised that our opinion of these mountain fighters had been too harsh. Certainly men could not be entirely bad who looked with such loyalty and tenderness upon the face of a dying comrade. After a few moments... The stimulation had its effect. The dying man revived and looked with true mountain suspicion at the unusual faces around him. 
His dimmed and blurring eyes cleared with a look of recognition as he recognised the Irish Dr Palmer. Hello, Doc. Is that you? he said. What are you doing here? At this question the doctor's face flushed up with a look of benevolence, and then with keenest business, as he said, Sam Hatfield, you have always been considered in this country a brave man. Now, Sam, he says, I suppose you would like to know the truth about yourself. Yes, doctor. Well, Sam, if you've got any messages for your home people, you better send them now, for you haven't got more than an hour to live. The wounded man's face never changed. He listened as if he had received the most indifferent information. He looked to the tallest of the mountaineers who was near him, and he came instantly and bent over him. The dying man said, it was Jefferson McCoy who led the attack on that house. I seed him as he came up in the light. You pass around the word for the boys and see that he is wiped out within the next 24 hours. That is all I ask of you fellows. He then turned to the doctor as if he had arranged all his earthly affairs and was ready to proceed with a clear conscience to the other world for judgment. Then the doctor said, Sam, I want to ask a favour of you. It isn't much. The dying man was growing weaker. He attempted to reply, and his voice failed him. More whisky was given him. He revived, but after a longer interval. The doctor then spoke rapidly and said, Sam, I've always treated you square. Now I want to ask something of you. This here land where you've been living belongs to this little lady here. The dying man began to scowl, but the doctor went on. It's her land, Sam, and I want to ask you as a favour if you will pass the word to the Hatfields to keep off of it in the future. Your word, Sam, given now, is just as good title as I will ask to it. The dying man paused for a few moments before making his reply. He then beckoned to the other mountaineer and said, Tell all the Hatfield boys to do as the doctor wants. I shall not describe the dying scene. Sam Hatfield was dead within half an hour. When we left early in the morning to return, there was a great congregation of Hatfields about the house, all armed. They came to bury the dead and swear vengeance against the living. The return ride to Logan Courthouse was made within two hours. I shall condense my story now, so as to give you its conclusion as briefly as possible. At two o'clock on the third day of Mrs. von Bergen's visit to this country, the Irish doctor gave her a certified cheque on a New York bank for $25,000. I escorted her out of that horrible country, leaving early that afternoon. By an unmerciful ride we reached Brownsville that night, in time to catch the early morning train, which came along at two o'clock in the morning. When the railroad was reached, I could not bid Mrs. von Bergen goodbye. I asked permission to accompany her to New York. The next day, Seated in a comfortable drawing-room coach, Mrs. von Bergen rallied from the fatigue of her exhausting journey and was able to talk more about herself. 
you have been so faithful to a perfect stranger. I did not like her accent upon the word stranger. That I feel it my duty to confide to you the secret reason of my hurried visit to Logan County and my still more hurried return. For if I am not in New York by tomorrow morning, if any accident should happen which should delay my arrival there, the whole object of my journey would be a failure. The matter is very simple, although I have made such a mystery of it. My only brother, who has been all in all to me since my husband died one year ago, he was the executor of my husband's estate, in settling it up we found that my husband was not a good man, but a very dishonest one. I can but speak plainly of him now. He had begun a series of fraudulent transactions in which my brother had been involved through his confidence in my husband. When my brother discovered the fraud, he sold everything he had to take up my husband's forgeries. He was able to get up the greater portion of them. The balance, amounting to $15,000, is due tomorrow. If not taken up, the forgeries are certain to be discovered and my noble brother disgraced and, I am sure, imprisoned. I know he would not survive such disgrace, but would kill himself sooner than endure such injustice. I came here as a last desperate resource to save him. I have been delayed beyond measure, how his heart must be bursting with the agony of suspense. He must have given up all hope by this time. The next morning we left the train at Jersey City at seven o'clock. The banks were not open until nine. It would have to be sharp work, as nine o'clock in New York is half past two in the afternoon Vienna time. The banks there close at four, just one hour and a half to reach him. I tried to get my companion to take some breakfast as we waited, but she could only swallow a cup of coffee. Pallid with fatigue and lack of sleep, she would not rest until we had reached the bank of Kessler & Co., where I was known. At nine o'clock sharp, after an hour's waiting in the street, we entered the bank. I explained to the alert cashier, whom I knew, in a word, ask no questions, said I, but prepare a cable credit on Vienna at once for instantaneous transmission of $15,000. It involves a question of financial honour. It must be there before the banks close. It will be, said the alert clerk, without the least sign of excitement. Thank God for the Atlantic cables and for alert cashiers who understand with half a word. An operator in the bank opened his instrument and called the cable office. Click, click went the instrument and then under special instructions the following message was rushed through to Vienna via Havre and Paris. Rothschilds & Co. Vienna Place to credit Kasper Steinmetz $15,000 Kessler & Co. Kasper Steinmetz 8 Blumenstrasse Vienna $15,000 to your credit at Rothschilds Kessler & Co. Two hours later, Mrs. von Bergen shed tears and nearly broke down as she received the following. Mrs. von Bergen, Albemarle Hotel, M.Y. Saved. God bless you. Casper. The commercial traveller was silent for a moment. And then he added, 
I saw my fellow countrywoman on board one of the German Lloyd steamers the next day. I watched her through blinding tears as she waved her hand free from the deck of the swiftly departing vessel. He then added, I have never seen her since. Then, after a moment, but I hope too soon. This is my last trip to this country. Through some kind influence, I have been restored to my former place in the army, and I have enough saved now to sustain the place. By this time next month, I hope to be in Vienna with my old uniform upon my back. What more, he hoped, I could not venture to say. But from the look of pleasant rumination upon his face, I am sure his hopes were agreeable ones, and I sincerely trust the gallant fellow was disappointed in none of them. End of section 19「Section 20 of An American Vendetta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An American Vendetta. A Story of Barbarism in the United States by T.C. Crawford. Appendix. Since my visit to West Virginia, several arrests have been made among the outlaws. None of the Hatfield people has been captured. However, nor is there any immediate prospect of their being punished. Charles Gillespie, one of the minor characters who assisted in the burning of the house of the McCoys, has been arrested. Ellis Mounts, who is accused of having murdered the daughter of Randall McCoy during the night attack upon the latter's house, has also been captured. Gillespie has made a confession, which will be used as evidence to capture others. It is as follows. On the first day of last January, I was at home when Cap Hatfield came along and said, Charlie, we're going into Kentucky tonight to have some fun. Get a horse and meet us and go along. Well, I did not know what was up, but I told Cap I would be on hand, and after a little trouble, I got a horse and was at the rendezvous, where I found Cap, Johns, Ellis, Bob, and Ellet Hatfield, old Jim Vance, Ellison Mounts, and a man who goes by the name of both Mitchell and Chambers, whom I know by the name of Gorilla. Jim Vance was in command of the party, and it was agreed at the start, before the real object of the trip was disclosed, that all should yield to everything he said and do all he might order us to do. It had been claimed that the whole Hatfield neighborhood was with us that night. This is not true. There were just nine of us, and the nine I have mentioned. Arriving at a convenient distance from the McCoy house, I was first made acquainted with the real object of our trip. Vance told us, that if old Randall McCoy and his son Cal were out of the road, every material witness against the men who had taken part in the murder of the three McCoy boys would be removed, and there could be no conviction of any of them, even if they might at some time be arrested for it. All had become tired of dodging the officers of the law, and wished to be able to sleep at home besides better bedfellows than Winchester rifles, and to occasionally take off their boots when they went to bed. This was the reason which old Jim Vance gave us, and Cap and John Hatfield agreed with him. Well, we determined, if the family would not come out when we should warn them to, to shoot through the windows and doors of the house from the ends and sides, with our Winchesters volley after volley, until all inside would be either dead or disabled. The only reply the McCoys made to our demand to come out was to bar and barricade the doors and prepare to fight us till the last. We shot through the windows and doors, and our shooting was responded to by old Rannell and Cal, the former with a double-barreled shotgun and the other with a Winchester. We had to be careful, as both were very good shots. I must tell you right here that I was not one of those who were doing the shooting. Me and one of the other Hatfields was put out along the road to act as guards to see that no one came up or that no one got past us. We never went near the house until the house was burning and all was on their way back to the Hatfields' house. When they came up, Ellison Mount said to me, Well, we killed the boy and the girl and I am sorry of it. We have made a bad job of it. We didn't get the man we wanted at all, meaning old Rannell. If we had got him, it would have been all right, and our work would not have been lost. 
There will be trouble over this. I asked him about the fight as we went along home, and he told me how Chambers had crawled up on the roof to get at those inside and to fire the house, when Randall McCoy heard him, and, firing at him through the shingles, shot his hand off behind the knuckles. He said Chambers got down, tied his hurt hand, and, taking his Winchester, began shooting again. It took some time to get the McCoys out, but finally the door opened and Cal ran out at the top of his speed towards a corn crib. Several banged away at him, but none of the shots took effect, and one or two more shots were fired when he was seen to jump up and fall forward. We went to him and found him dead, with a big hole in the back of his head. The girl came out of one of the two dwelling houses and wanted to get into one where the family was, and some of the men told her to go back, but she knew them and named them, and she was killed. Cap was blamed for this, but I think Mounts did it. I could not find out who struck old Mrs. McCoy with the butt of the revolver, but I think Mounts did this too. The hammer of the revolver penetrated her skull, and when she fell, several of the men jumped upon her, breaking her ribs, and when they left her, thought she was dead. I had let my horse go on the way to the house of the McCoys, and had to get up behind Mounts, better known as Cotton Top and Cotton Eye, because he has white hair and white eyes. On the way home, he talked a great deal. Once he said, if John Hatfield had not shot before we were ready, there would not have been one of the McCoys in that house alive now. That shot gave them inside a correct idea of the location of some of the men, and they kept us well in sight right along thereafter. They kept us so far away that it was a long time before we got up to the house and we were able to do anything. Mounts told me that he himself made the first move towards getting into the house, breaking into the annex to the cabin, where he found Alfaro McCoy and the little children. He demanded that the men in there should come out. She told him that there were no men about the annex, but Mounts insisted that she make a light. She told him to give her a match and she would satisfy him of the truth of her words. Then Cap Hatfield yelled, Shoot her! Blank her! And let's go on. Then Mounts shot her and she fell dead without a word. They began shooting through the doors and windows of the cabin, thinking that some of those in it would be looking to see what was going on in the annex and by the promiscuous shooting to kill all within the house. After this volley, nothing was done for several minutes. Cal McCoy, from the loft of the cabin, in the meantime got sight of the men and began firing at them rapidly that they all got behind a log pig pen for safety. There they concluded to burn the house and Mitchell, by dodging around for a little while, managed to get to the roof with a torch and fire the roof, but not till old Rannell had shot off one of his hands, as I have described. This was done with a revolver, and the old man was not two feet from Mitchell when he fired. He could only see his hand, and he did the best he could at the distance. Well, we all went back to Cap Hatfield's, and most of us stayed in his house all night, leaving early in the morning. I did not see the gang again. There was one of the nine missing, but I could not tell who it was. None of us spoke of the fact but once. I left home within a day or two, and have not been back since, and have no means of knowing what is going on. End of section 20. End of An American Vendetta, a story of barbarism in the United States by T.C. Crawford.